Hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, this is the I Feel You Feel uh, event 2022 uh, with Era Youth Mental Health. Uh, so I'm co-hosting with Amira. My name is Inej Mali Sarmento. I'm an Era Youth Mental Health leader. Amira, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, I'm Amira Shamsi. Uh, I'm uh, the mental health officer of the FEMIS organization. Okay. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, our first guest, Nick Morgan. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Hi. Nick. Nice you want to introduce you. yourself, Nick? Yes, of course. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nick. I'm the founder and director of Euro Youth Mental Health, uh, also leading on youth involvement uh, at the moment. Uh, but I'm here as our first guest today, excited to be interviewed by Ines and Amiga. Yeah, I'm very excited to interview because we can ask a lot of questions. Okay. We don't have much time, but... <laughs> I would really like to hear you talk about why you created Aero Youth Mental Health and focusing it on youth and not mental health in general. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Euro Youth Mental Health was set up after I was in the process of doing my master's uh, back in 2014. And we, uh, I know I was doing a master's comparing youth mental health services, one in the UK and one in Croatia during which time I kind of mapped out organizations across Europe uh, or was looking for youth organizations across Europe and and looking for kind of macro European wide organizations. And there weren't any uh, doing work specifically with young people. Um, there were there are some great organizations doing mental health work across Europe and Europe wide, such as Mental Health Europe and um, Gamayam and Euphemy. Um, but there was nothing specifically on young people. Uh, as a youth worker myself, I guess it's, it's and as someone who's worked in youth mental health field in the UK for a long time, I felt this needed to change. And through the behest of my friends uh, nagging me to, to set up this company, um, uh, that, that's what that's how it happened. I set it up. I thought, and I guess it's worth noting, you know, our focus is very much on co-production and young people's voices as opposed to providing a, a clinical or therapeutic service or that sort of thing. I think we wanted to advocate or be advocates for young people um, hence, uh, and have young people leading the way. Thank you so much. Amira, would you like to ask uh, something to Nick? Um, how do you feel, how do you look after your own mental health, Nick? Oh, how do I look after my own mental health? Um, that's a great question. I guess it's a funny one. I think I'm one of those people who often, as a youth worker, you often kind of ask young people to do as I say, not as I do. I don't know if you've heard that phrase in English. So I'm not always the best at looking after my own mental health. However, when I can, I used to enjoy running a lot, uh, but I'm currently injured at the moment. So that's impeding that. Uh, you also may notice, actually, at least two of my uh, pastimes are in this room. I also notice how messy this room is. I should have tidied up before coming on. Um, so I, I read a lot and collect a lot of comics, uh, which you'll see behind me. Um, and I also play guitar and drums. Uh, so you'll notice we've got an electric drum kit uh, behind me. Um, yeah, and I, I think obviously comics takes you off to a fantasy world. It's like reading a good book, right? Um, but also music. I think um, I love going to live concerts as well. I think when listening to music and playing music it you have to you can focus on only that thing and it so it helps it's an it's, it's a type of mindfulness i guess for me uh whereas often it's considered something that you do as in a quiet chilled space for me it's something that's really loud and energetic um that helps me focus and not think about kind of the anxieties that are going on for me uh at present those are just some of the ways i guess Thank you so much. And if you don't mind me asking, we do have lived yeah. experience in mental health. How important yeah. is therapy, in your opinion, with, for someone who's experiencing mental health struggles? Oof, that's a big question. Um, yes, I do. Um, 
and uh yeah i think it's, it's it's a part of what i do it's a part of who i am my lived experience i'm uh diagnosed with clinical depression and general anxiety disorder was diagnosed as an adult not as a young person which is it's rare at least in the uk um and i think yeah and i have so i think what I, i'm happy to share like my story around mental health is i, I did i had a breakdown when i was about um 20 two 23 i'm 38 now believe it or not and um i i, I broke I, I literally broke down and i don't use that word lightly because i don't think it's a word that should just be thrown around or phrase uh but i just started crying in my car on my way to do some work at a school of all things uh with young people going on, on my way to support young people with their own mental health problems um and yeah, I just didn't know what was happening. So I, I spoke, luckily I was working for an organization in the UK called Bernardo's who, who had a great employee assistance program. Uh, and I got counseling for the first time ever. One of many different types of therapy available to people, well, available to people, not all therapies are available to all people, it's worth noting. Um, and I, yeah, I guess at that time, I loved it. I've had ups and downs experiences of therapy since then, but that first experience um, was great. You know, I had four or five sessions. I was like, oh my God, I can just offload all this rubbish onto this stranger who I don't really know and then leave and I feel light and fluffy. Um, but yeah, I think I think therapy is important. To be, if I'm being honest, and this is a personal thing, not a Euro Youth Mental Health line, um, I, I believe that all young people should have should have some form of um, maybe it's not therapy, but mentor that they speak to at various stages in their uh, adolescence. Maybe it's a, uh, a well-being check in once a year with a with a counselor or a youth worker or a mentor or something just as check ins about an opportunity to offload. What are your anxieties at the moment? What are your struggles? And so I wouldn't I don't think I'd call that therapy, but. I think it talking to people and um, it, about things that are going on for you that aren't necessarily on your inside network, like your family or your friends, uh, it is super beneficial um, to anyone personally. And that's been my experience of it, at least. Thank you so much for sharing. And hearing you say that makes me think, how do we how and when and where do we draw the line between a therapist and a friend? Oof. Um, that's a classic question though, isn't it? I think um, I'm, 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 uh, my friends used to tell me, so I used to do a lot more one-to-one -one work with young people with, in a therapeutic capacity because uh, the term therapist can actually be used very easily by anyone um and i think they used to say they used to joke to me like if i if we were out or something and I, something was going on for them especially when i was in the height of maybe doing some of my more therapeutic work i i'd be asking them very very um open questions and and kind of getting them to uh, try and open up and talk to me about what their issues are or problems were and they'd all get to a point where they'd realize what i'm doing and kind of be like stop trying to therapize me i just want to i just want you to be my friends so there is that kind of, I don't think friends and loved ones should bear all the responsibility of what, of, of carrying that, because carrying the weight of someone else's real severe mental health problems is a heavy load to carry. So I think sometimes friends and family are great to be there just to listen and not offer advice. Um, I personally hate getting advice off friends and family unless I specifically ask for it. Um, so i do think yeah i think it's all good i think when it when it becomes I think we're all trying to be more open-minded with mental health across the world if you you know it's what today on world mental health day i think people are more woke now to mental health needs and support and than we ever were when i was young and starting out in this field um but at the same time it's yeah i think we shouldn't uh, there is a danger then if you will of everyone trying to be a bit of a uh, an amateur therapist and being like, oh, I know about mental health. I can talk to you about that. Uh, and actually, yeah, like I said, as soon as it's actually out of your wheel, when it's not a friendship thing, it's actually like maybe just helping them find support is the best thing you can do. Thank you so much. 
Amira, would you like to ask a question? I have a, yeah. Yeah, uh, Nick, I'm very interesting. Like, um, I would love to know uh, for you what are the biggest improvements you have seen in the mental health work since you uh, work with the use your. Yeah, it's a really good question. And yeah, there have been obvious changes. Um, so I started working in this field just after I qualified as a youth worker. Uh, I didn't train as a mental health specific worker or a practitioner. Um, I trained as a youth worker, but fell into a, a role, which for me was exactly what personally, I think lots of young people who are struggling with mental health need. And that's just a supportive worker for, with a youth work background. Now youth workers roles are very much about occupational support around education and, and work and life in general. And mental health obviously plays into that. But um, yeah, so that would have been, so when I fell into that work, that was 2008. So it's been doing some quick maths, 14 years since I started in this field. And yeah, there've been vast, vast, vast changes. Um, obviously living and growing up in the UK, I've seen it firsthand. Um, I think my parents are a good, I think you can always judge these sorts of things uh, by your parents' kind of experiences or way, how they've changed, if anything. I do think that the older you get, the harder it is to change. Um, but I have seen in the last, you know, five years, Amira, my parents may be talking more openly about their mental health, um, which their generation when they were my age was just something you just didn't do, especially for men. Um, there was that classic, like, you know, man up sort of. Uh, and my, my dad played rugby in Wales, which is where I'm from. And it's just a very, like, just get over it. Here's a beer, you know. Um but my dad, even my dad now will open up and, and he'll say to me if he notices I'm being a bit off, is everything OK? And sometimes I'm like, oh, no, it is. I'm, I'm just tired. Or sometimes I'm like, oh, actually, I've just had a really rubbish week. And uh, so, yeah, I think it has changed vastly, I think. But however, that being said, from a European perspective, it's still very hit or miss. Like, I think one of the biggest reasons we set up Euro Youth Mental Health was because of the disparities and the differences between countries across Europe and actually we have a lot to learn and a lot to gain from working together um yeah so you know it's still there's still a long way to go in some places um, and another th so a big thing in the UK that's happening at the moment is there's a lot of calls for mental health to be more in ingrained in education in school um there's a great campaign called Three Walking Dads uh, today. Um, and uh, they finished today. They'd done a campaign where they'd walked around all the different parliaments in the UK, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England. And they've all, uh, they all lost daughters to suicide. Um, and their campaign is to bring the saying that we need to talk about these things more in school. We shouldn't hide away from talking about these taboo subjects. Um, and I think they're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think they are hard to talk about, but there are lots of amazing professionals, youth work professionals, to talk about these sensitive topics. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a long answer here. I hope that kind of helped navigate that. Thanks a lot. Very, very consistent. Uh, Inesh, we have a question on the chat. Maybe we can uh, ask Nick about uh, Alejandra. Oh. Uh, she, uh, maybe you can read it. Uh, yeah, uh, so Nick, uh, Alejandra asked, um, since you've mentioned about the difficulties of opening up about mental health as a man, uh, maybe you could give us a, you know, a little bit of a... Yeah, an insight into that. Um, absolutely. Thanks for your question, Alejandra. I hope you're well. We'll be seeing you later, actually. Um, yeah, it's um, I'm I'm an open book. I've I'm the sort of person that cries at everything, and I've never really been that ashamed of it. Um, when I was younger, as a as a teenager, you know, I did used to get told to stop crying and man up. And I remember <laughs> being being asked um, by by my dad, and he. You know, he won't mind me saying this. He, like we've all, he's changed. We've all changed since that long ago. About if we got into a fight as a boy, I always found this funny. If I got into a fight as a as a boy, he'd ask if I won. 
I wouldn't necessarily get like a, I'd get a telling off, but it would it, it also ask, did I win? And it's kind of, I just find that whole like, but we got violence anyway. Um, what, you know, it's a perfect opportunity for me to promote my podcast, Angry, Angry Little Welshman and Friends, um, which I do uh, outside of your mental health. And in that, I, I open up about my, um, my own experiences with mental health problems um, as a way of hopefully inspiring other men to be more open and honest about their mental health experiences. Um, sorry, I'm going to turn my phone on silent. I'm clearly in demand today. Um, and one of the things I think, uh, another thing I'll be, I'm going to be releasing later on today is um, a, a 30 day diary uh, of my mental health. Um, I, do, I do think as a man, it's, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of toxic mental health men's mental health stuff online as well. I think it's to, there's a fine line between understanding what's um, real men's mental health conversation and what's toxic as well. I don't know if I answered your question properly, uh, Alejandro. I guess I don't find it difficult and never had. I cried when Professor Xavier died. Spoilers, men three, um, and uh, but at the same time, you know, I know there's still a bit of a um a bit of a food opening up at say, the rugby club that i'm um working at uh playing at, at, at today um so yeah i hope that helps and answers yeah uh, it did and thank you so much for keeping on time you're amazing <laughs> you're done Yes. Um, so I want to remind everyone that uh, this is a discussion about mental health. So please uh, keep in mind that there will be some triggering topics. So take care of yourself. And if you need a break, just hop off and come back in if you feel like to. Uh, yeah, coming up next, there will be Maria Walsh. But we'll have a 10 minute break, right, Nick? Yeah, okay. I'll see you soon.
Hey, I think we are back in the in the stream. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm sorry, having some technical issues. Um, welcome back. Hope you had a, a good break. And I am going to invite our next guest. So Maria Walsh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. <laughs> yes, okay. yes, you are. Thank you very much. How are you guys getting on? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're very excited to talk talk with you i'm gonna do a live kind of shimmy here of uh, of light because i can see I, I might be um getting a little bit too bright with the sun but how are you how are you both doing we're doing good very good thank you happy thank you very yeah, happy happy world mental health day you both. yeah yeah so, <laughs> go ahead amira yeah so we are gonna ask you to uh, introduce yourself uh, maria if you can uh, tell us from where are you from, where do you live, uh, and uh, if you have experienced any mental uh, experience uh, in the mental health that you would love to share yeah, with us. Perfect. Um, well, uh, happy World Mental Health Day to anybody tuned in or will no doubt perhaps watch this back. Um, my name is Maria Walsh. I'm an Irish MEP, Ireland's youngest MEP uh, to date. And I say to date because I'm hoping a number of young people run in 2024 European elections and um, my track record gets squashed. Um, I'm 35 years of age and I live in the west coast of Ireland, uh, just on the border between Mayo and Galway. Um, I'm a first time politician. Uh, while I've been elected for three years, I didn't grow up. Um, in politics, um, but I grew up in rooted in community um, work. So youth organizations, um, uh, church gate collections, sweeping community centers, sports, that was my politics. Um, and then kind of what brought me in line with politics to, to find my bravery of putting my hand up and, and, and running. Um, I essentially didn't see someone who looked like me or sounded like me or who was LGBTI and wanting to live in rural Ireland, who was a young female, but wanting to do something, had a voice and uh, didn't see equality or feel equality in all its forms, um, that seen social issues, uh, and in large part, mental health. Uh, so for me, uh, mental health has always been a part of who I am. It's part of everybody. We all have it. Um, and I, 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 I stepped into politics <clears throat> in large part because of all that I just shared, but because of the issues that were really impacting community in my life we're not always coming to the fore. Um, and I always think everything needs a little bit more empathy and vulnerability and um, and politics should be no different. Um, and when we talk about mental health, specifically on the day like today, but uh, Nick and, and y'all at EYMH uh, will know well and truly uh, that I talk about mental health with my team and in the parliament uh, for the three years I've been elected all day, every day in all committee work that I do and in all events that I do. Uh, because we need to break the stigma uh, of it and the taboo and also recognize the fact that if we continue to not engage with it, if we continue to pretend it doesn't exist, um, particularly as policymakers and politicians, um, then we are heading for a very, very scary future, uh, particularly our young people, uh, when they won't have somewhere to go when they need the help the most or won't have anybody to fully appreciate and understand that mental health is everyone's business. Therefore, if we put it off like a Band-Aid, just patch it up there, um, uh, eventually everything explodes. Uh, and essentially then we, 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 we lose people 
to depression, to anxiety, to suicidal ideation, uh, to eating disorders, and unfortunately, the list the list goes on. Uh, for me personally, as I mentioned, I grew up in that small rural community called Shrewl, um, a very small spot um, in in the west coast of Ireland, and uh, within a twenty mile radius, um, maybe even a bit less, we lost multiple people of all ages uh, from death by suicide. Um, so for me, I from a very young age um, saw not just the life lost, but the lives left after uh, a suicide decision Um, and the extremes of what mental health uh, challenges and issues can can lead to someone. So um, that's me in a nutshell. And sorry, ladies, I went on for a little bit too long there. No, that's fine. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. Can I really in across you there say, um, I apologize, I keep calling you ladies uh, or girls. It, I don't see your pronouns and I should ask before I use them. So apologies if the language is not is not inclusive there. Uh, but correct me and, and I'll make sure and be mindful of how I how I speak to you both uh, for the rest of the time. Thank you so much for asking. My Yeah, my pronouns are she, her. I didn't put them on the name because it's already too long. Uh, yeah, Amira, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and yeah, uh, I know it's only me, but it cuts, so I may not uh, hear everything. Uh, but um, I have a, I have another question, uh, but you already answered uh, a little bit. Uh, but I'm very interesting uh, when I saw. Uh, when I saw all your experiences, I'm very interesting to know where did your interest or inspiration come from uh, to propose a, such a kind of proposition you have uh, made to the European uh, Parliament about the mental health. How did you come to to uh, to to such a kind of proposition? Uh, when we look at your uh, experiences, uh, like we don't expect uh, the mental health topic, and I'm really curious to to know how did you get yeah. to, to that well, yeah uh no and brilliant question um um you know for me uh, I, I mean my own life my own life uh my own living uh a situation certainly uh brought me brought the topic in the sector of mental health to the fore and everything that i do but here in the parliament since being elected you know i i still remember first day of school here in the parliament um and we are asked what, uh, as a group of young members elected within the EPP group, which, which is where I sit here in the parliament, um, you know, what are your core topics? And I was like, you know, equality and LGBTI, uh, uh, mental health and, uh, and young young people uh, in politics. And I always remember... Um, you know, the face of one of one or two of my colleagues being like, does she know where she's sitting? Like this mental health is not seen as a competency here of the European Parliament. Um, equality is moving, but not within the rooms of all, uh, of all across the Parliament, just some. Um, so for me then, it, 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 it instantly was a driver then to say, right, th- this is where conversations need to happen. Uh, and the more I talk about mental health, the more... I would hope more and more would would be included to it. So my team and I, I sit on the uh, Employment and Social Affairs Committee. I also sit on the Justice and Home Affairs Committee called LIBE for short. And then I sit on the Culture and Education. And it was incredibly important for my team and I, and they just value mental health just as much as I, um, um, that everything we do in terms of legislation and non-legislation, so any files that we go for, um, any engagements like this that we do there's always an element of mental health in it um and bit by bit we we chip away at that so from that we got a rapporteurship on an employment file on the digital way of work with our mental health which is hugely important because all voices from across the political houses came together and asked for things like an eu mental health strategy an eu year dedicated to mental health um a psychosocial risk uh, directive um, blueprints or, or signposting. Uh, but I remember uh, Nick uh, wearing a Paddy's cap uh, in one of our first meetings 
um, when when I wasn't long elected, uh, and it was really refreshing. I was chairing it. It was really refreshing to hear all like-minded NGOs, stakeholders, leaders like Nick and 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 you all um, when we talk about mental health being in a room together and for some that was the first time they were meeting anybody else um which is a shame because there's a lot of great groups individuals and people that are doing amazing work in mental health right across europe but we're not tapping into their expertise um and that was really the 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 first sign of that and and working with the coalition and the alliance two groups here in the european parliament um got me closer into what really needs to happen what has been happening not working and where do we need to go for for this and amir i i uh, i'm pretty sure amira am i pronouncing that correctly yeah. yes exactly i'm pretty sure I may, have, I may have not answered your question uh so apologies come back at me again because i went on a tangent of yeah. all of all things uh and and uh <laughs> i get excited when i see uh, uh talk to young people about mental health so apologies rain me in rain me in <laughs> No, it's a great answer. Thank you for sharing your, your experience. And it's a great chance to have an MEP in front of us. And I have so much question to ask you. Uh, but my next question will be, uh, is the mental health being seriously uh, announced uh, in the European Parliament? Great question. I mean, I think in some, I think in some organize or in some rooms it is. And by rooms, I mean in our own committee and employment, I think it is, because we have a number of great colleagues, both in uh, socialists and renew, um, and the left, who um, and ECR too. I should include them that really do phenomenal work within their own communities as well as their own legislative and non-legislative work in the parliament. So we are moving um, in culture and education. We can certainly see more improvements. So when we talk about this new year, we're still in the EU year for youth. We'll move into an EU year of skills and training. Um, and it's really important that when we talk about that, that a part of that, um, based off the EU year of youth, based off the Conference on the Future of Europe that we we, we recently had, that mental health is called for. And therefore, that's, that's what we have to answer our citizens for. Um, on the Justice and Home Affairs Committee in particular, this is where I put an awful lot of amendments in uh so a lot of legislative work so when we talk about migration reception centers that there's age appropriate mental health support services in place there when we talk about cyber bullying or gender-based violence these these key topics and issues we look at in this committee obviously mental health is a cornerstone of all of that too when we look at lgbti rights both inside and outside the eu mental health is a part of that too because we know from research um that lgbti plus community members face incredible discrimination uh, and and very, very heavy, uh, very heavy mental health challenges uh, in that in that community group of which I'm a part of. Um, what was most excited of recent was uh, we were uh, my team and I were really pushing my colleagues too, were really pushing for an EU year dedicated to mental health in 2023. Sadly, we could not deliver that yet. <laughs> I, I'm allowed to lick my wounds, but I was a little bit upset. I'm not going to lie, which which is which is a really important thing uh, when we when we talk honestly and openly uh, about politics. That uh, while the EU year of skills and training is phenomenal, and I I really welcome that. Um, I really wanted a new year dedicated to mental health, so that you know you and I can all continue our work and and really bring as much change as we can um but what we did get is for the first time ever from my research um a president of the commission ursula van der Leyen, talking about mental health in her state of the union speech and for anybody listening who might not follow politics all that well or might not understand what the hell i'm talking about um the state of the union is a speech uh, given once a year every september by the president of the commission and sets out the agenda and essentially you know, as politicians and member states, we're clinging on to those words to make sure what is in, what's not, and what we can work for. Um, and what she said and what she dedicated is a citizen's dialogue. So 200 voices across the member states will come together. Um, I'd be pushing for even the countries like the United Kingdom and other enlargement countries too, so that when we grow uh, and we expand across Europe, so too is our mental health strategy. Um, and that was a huge, 
welcome. Um, and now we gotta we gotta roll up our sleeves and get to work on that. So you you hear it in certain conversations, you hear it in certain leaders like Ursula or our president or our uh, health commissioner uh, Stella Kirkiaidis, who herself is a trained sci child psychologist. So you hear it, but we need to see more of it, um, and not just here in Europe in the Brussels bubble, but across our member states too. So yes and no, all in the same bin. <laughs> I'm trying to be positive, ladies. Try to be positive. <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, Ines, do you have uh, any question for our guests? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I would, I'm really interested to know how you manage to um, stay grounded and um, really encompassing your emotions in a way that when you are faced with barriers in order to push... Um, positivity and making sure that mental health is being discussed how do you manage when you get a pushback oh great question um you know and unfortunately i answer this professionally and personally um because there's sometimes where i have to put the professional armor on um and mask some of the disappointment particularly when i lead a team um and I'm speaking with young people in particular because, you know, if I come out and say every day has been really challenging because I'm new to this still, even though I'm three years in, but it's, it's, there's days where it's really hard. Um, there's days when conversations happen around you and you can't really get into them, but you know, they're happening and decisions being made in other rooms with other, with other folks and, and you can't, you're banging at the door, but you can't get in. Um, they're incredibly hard, but but I didn't get into this for 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 an easy journey either. You know, I got into this because I felt, as a rural kid in Ireland, um, I just didn't see folks who looked like me, or sounded like me, or acted like me, and if you don't see it, then you got to get involved and change it. And and that's what I. The, the why, the why anybody does anything is really important, particularly when you step into the political arena. Um, and for me, if you're not trying to get at the decision making table or or you're at it and you're not saying what really needs to happen, then 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 that's where it becomes a shame. So that helps me fight in terms of the resilience and getting there. But I've also had a lot of personal, um, personal journeys too. You know, I, I go to talk therapy, um, because for me, my confidence gets knocked quite a bit. Um, and separating what is real and what is not both what is online and what is not where and how I want to show up in this world and keep rooted. Uh, a talk therapist really guides me in that. Um, I'm not great at taking time off, which is a problem, but it's going to have to change because uh, my capacity is it, it's getting too much and I'm not delivering when I need to and how I want to uh, and show up rooted. So that will change. But um, a lot of it is when you look back and you realize, hey, I've come a long way, but there's a long way to go. Then that's the internal resilience clock to say, right, you know, the skills and the lessons learned um, with the mentality of win or learn. There's never a loss or a negative here. It's how can we tweak things to learn a little bit more about our mental health, about how others operate, how can we listen better, how can we just tweak things a little bit better to make sure the mo more people are joining us. And, and then if you have that mentality, and sometimes it works for me, sometimes it doesn't, I have to continue to tweak myself then then you get a little a step a step closer to where you want to be. Thank you so much. And for these last five minutes, uh, mm -hmm. Andrea, do you have another question? Um, maybe I will be maybe interesting uh, to know. I don't know if five minutes is enough uh, to know what are the steps that are being taken by the European Parliament uh, regard, regarding to the mental health? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, great, great question. Um, and ladies, I will try and keep my answers closer together so I don't uh, continue on. But um, so a couple of things, an EU mental health strategy, first in its kind, is desperately needed to happen. And how I visualize that is every senior or junior minister in health, specifically mental health, uh, we need to coordinate um, uh, a round table here in the parliament um, and ultimately treat our mental health pandemic, which it is, it's a silent pandemic, exactly how we treated COVID, where EU member states are working together and not one side of the EU is benefiting and the other is falling behind. Um, the psychosocial directive, uh, her, uh, directive is essentially an extension of the health and safety at work. So when we rock up to a new business, uh, or a new enterprise or a community, you know, everybody's physical health is minded. But ultimately, you and I all know, anybody tuned in here knows, mental health is as much importance as a physical health. If not, it, it, it's on par. You know, you can't, you don't put your feet on the ground and only your physical uh, elements move. You know, you, you, your brain is working too, and therefore we need to adapt to that and, and make sure that's included. An EU year dedicated to mental health would certainly allow for further conversation um, and for me, begin to break down that stigma that we desperately need to have. Something I always say when talking about mental health is we cannot continue to stigmatize mental health and mourn the loss of it. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have incredibly high numbers from U uh, UNICEF reporting, from OECD reporting, from the WHO reporting, uh, from various fields, both in Europe and abroad, um, that mental health is not going away. And we're seeing high numbers of depression, suicide, ideation, eating disorders, anxiety. And if we're not treating that, what are we doing? Like if we are not helping individuals, particularly our young people, then we are in a further fight uh, to create a space of welcome and safety, not just in our communities, our schools, our work programs, our businesses, our policy, but also in our minds. Like, that it's simply not good enough to continue to uh, lose people uh, from mental health when when we can work together, and we did it with COVID, when we can work together and find better selves. Um, great organizations like Spun Out or Jigsaw are doing phenomenal work at the Irish front. Mental Health Reform or Mental Health Europe is doing phenomenal work uh, bringing together organizations um, across Europe too, but we need to join up thinking. Um, and we need to support folks like yourself and Nick and the crew and and you both at making sure that these platforms live um, continuously and not just on days like today, which is great, World Mental Health Day, but uh, we need them. We need them a hell of a lot more than than what we're what we're providing now. Thank you so much, Maria, for your answer, for your sharing. Uh, we are com going now to the end of this talk. Uh, with you, but before to end, um, we have uh, a comment from Alejandra on the chat ah. uh, that she said, uh, I love you how you talk about mental health, never forgetting about the intersectional point of view of it. As a person part of LGBT plus community as well, I completely agree with you how you explain it and how it affects differently depending on so many factors. Thank you for all your work on it and for pushing for having a European year, year of mental health. It will happen eventually. Here, here. It will happen. Thank you. So it will happen. We will deliver. Yeah. Thank you so much for your participation. And uh, uh, I'm give you the, uh, the words, Inesh. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. It was great having you here and having all your input. So we're gonna go for a break. Enjoy. And you were having a break. I'm sorry, Amira? No, I was just gonna say, enjoy your break. Thank you very much for the conversation. Happy World Mental Health Day to each and every one of you. Um, and I can only stress that I hope each and every one of you, if not more, will join us next year for World Mental Health Day. And we're all a little bit kinder and nicer and sweeter to ourselves as well as those in our community. So be well, be uh, be, be kind, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming.
So coming up next, we have a researcher, researcher Dennis van der Mar. I hope, I think I butchered his name, but yeah, we'll be back at 4.15, at, yeah, 4.15 p.m.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we would like to invite our next guest, Dennis. Uh, and I'm not gonna to not going to attempt to say your surnames again. So I can do it myself. Sure. <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Dennis van der Meer, not Maart, but that's, that's okay. Um, I am from the north of the Netherlands, uh, where I did a PT in the lovely city of Groningen. Um, after, after my PT, I went to the um, University of Oslo in, in Norway, which is also a beautiful place. And uh, now I'm uh, back in the Netherlands since a couple of years, uh, living in, in, in Maastricht, uh, which I can also recommend. I'm, I'm living in nice cities. Groningen, uh, Oslo, Maastricht, all, all beautiful, at the uh, border with, uh, with Belgium. And um, I'm happy to be here today talking with you about uh, mental health. Um, I guess I'm invited to talk about my research, which is mostly about um, 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 genes, environment, and, and, and how they come together to um, to shape the, the, the to shape your brain and and how that um, determines uh, your behavior uh, including mental health so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about that or anything anything related to it so that's exactly what i wanted to ask about so i want i would love to hear you talk about the project environmental and sure, how sure. that intersects with mental health Right. Uh, environmental, that's indeed a, a, a very interesting project. Um, environmental is um, a, a large-scale uh, European project, a large uh, consortium of, of uh, labs actually across the world that have come together to um, investigate the role of, of, environmental, uh, of environmental factors in, in influencing mental health. So that's a very simple aim, actually. But... Uh, you know, it's it's all very complex. So we need we need a lot of data. So environmental basically brings together data from from millions of people actually, um, and it, it it does some cool stuff. It does, for instance, um, uh, not just questionnaires where we ask people about um, uh, uh, what type of stressful life events they have, uh, but also we use uh, satellite imagery data. Uh, so so you can kind of imagine uh, like Google Maps, right? That that um, we look at um, uh, stuff like urbanicity, so, so how, how uh, densely populated is an area. We look at um, noise pollution, all sorts of other pollution, um, um, climate, climate change as well. So, so, so uh, differences in temperature over time and everything. Um, yeah, all those types of measures that you can actually uh, nowadays uh, quite accurately capture by satellite imagery that's being integrated with uh, what we already know from, from people that have participated in all sorts of studies across Europe. We combine that uh, so we get, get maps of Europe or, or, or the world or whatever that you can you know, point at a certain place and you can couple that place to, to um, the mental health of people living in that place. So that's... Uh, you know, we can we can get a lot of data out of that and, and uh, really try to identify what's important for people to, to, to find out what's driving mental health and hopefully of course eventually with that uh, find ways to optimize mental health um, what, yeah there's so many cool things about the environment for instance I think you'll also like the the, the, um, the virtual reality aspect of it so that's a, that's a different what we call a different work package where we give people virtual reality glasses um, and um, put them in certain environments, right? Uh, virtual environment, of course, and then we do something to that environment. We, for instance, degrade it and, and uh, see how that influences uh, how people are feeling about that environment. Um, the plan is to eventually also use that type of, of approach to, to have some interventions. Uh, what I think, for instance, quite cool from, from past studies is that you can use it very well to treat um, fear of heights, for instance, you know, that, that uh, you put people uh, on top of a high building virtually and you just slowly desensitize them for, 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 for heights. I mean, that's, that's just a simple example, but you can see, you know, in, in a 
such a virtual environment, you can do stuff you wouldn't really want to do in a regular therapy session, right? So, um, yeah, so that's, you're that's talking stuff. about exposure therapy. Uh, yeah, that's that's just one example. I have to say, by the way, that's completely not my uh, not my topic at all. But it just um, I, was, I was talking to other uh, people in that uh, project, and it's just one of the many cool things we do uh, in environmental. Yeah. Yeah. So for the people who don't know, exposure therapy is when someone has a phobia or a fear, for example, fear of heights, like Dennis was saying, and Therapy exposure is basically desensitizing the person to that fear. Uh, so if it's heights, like Dennis is saying, you're not going to put someone on the top of the building. So maybe virtually you can um, introduce that person to an environment that will cause fear, but it, it is safe and it's, it's um, really common therapy, just not getting into much technical stuff mm -hmm. thank you so much and it sounds like a very interesting project and amira do you have any questions yeah thank you uh, denise uh, i i'm very interesting to know uh, uh how did you get the ins inspiration to uh, to do this research why this research especially um it's it's kind of boring i have to say uh as a, as an I've had a very straightforward path in, into research. Um, why am I why am I doing this? Because I think it's fascinating. Right? I, I, I literally at high school I just thought biology was the, was the most interesting uh, subject there was, and from then I studied biology in, at university as well. And then, what's the coolest thing about biology? It's it's the brain. At least that's, that's I, I think many people agree with me that the brain is. Right, kind of the, the coolest thing out there. So um, studied neurobiology and from neurobiology, I got an internship at a neuroimaging um, institute. And from that, I got a PhD. And after that, I got a postdoc. So it's, it's all just a very straightforward uh, how I rolled into this. I, I just always try to study what I think is most fascinating. And that's, uh, that's how I ended up uh, looking at, at mental health. I mean, I, 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 I'm very happy to be contributing to mental health in general. I think it's super important. And at the same time, I have the day-to-day -day drive that I just love the mechanistic aspects of it. I think it's, it's so fascinating how the brain works. So yeah, those two things. Long-term, I love the fact that I'm contributing to uh, something this extremely important to, to, to optimize. And on the other hand, my day-to-day -day drive is, is uh, curiosity for, for uh, how the brain works. So, which is more important, the gene of, or the environment? <laughs> oh, that's a typical question. Okay, that's that's. Um, I like this explanation once uh, that um, you have a sheet of paper, and um, what's more important for the for the service area of that paper is it is it uh, the the jeez um, my English today uh, is it is it the length or the width? No, it's it's. Both of them, right? It's combined. Um, neither is more important. Um, what I do like to also think of is that genetics kind of gives you the the, the your potential, you know, your 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 maximum and your minimum. Whereas the environment determines where you kind of end up in that uh, on that continuum. Does that make sense? So it's 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 way. It makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. So basically, you're saying that both components are important. You can't take one and keep the other. That being said, of course, you have you know um, you have disorders, you have traits, you have uh, stuff that's purely genetic uh, that you can't influence, right? Uh, um, Huntington's disease is caused by by a, a single gene. Um, that's not entirely true, by the way. Uh, see immediately uh, you think some 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 aspects are completely genetic but for instance with Huntington, it does also matter how you are, uh, how you treat it how you, you can still influence the severity of diseases for instance so even with like this pure monogenic diseases you can still influence what it does on a day-to-day -day basis yeah so it's not just the the nature of the human being it's, it's not just the nature, nature, it's the human being. Uh, yeah. I think we're past the nature versus the nature debate. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I really, I'm really interested. Like, why youth? 
mental health? Why not, why not just focus on mental health in general? Why focus on youth mental health? Because adolescence is a time of, uh, like one of my uh, colleagues would say, uh, heightened plasticity. Uh, we are, um, you know, there's there, there's a lot of stuff going on in the brain in, in adolescence. It's it's a period where um, all our neurons are pruned, where where uh, you know there, there's um, we are more sensitive to to uh, a lot of aspects. Um, we have a lot of tough life decisions also to make that will shape us for the rest of our life, which is why we are more plastic in that period of life, right? As in, as in this is why when we become uh, more and more who we are. And of course, there's also a lot of pressure on us in this, in this period of life, right? Um, this is when we choose what we will, what we will do, what, to, who to, who to become partners with, who to, um, what, what direction, what type, type of career you want to have. That's, that's a lot of pressure that's been put on you. And that's, that's also, of course, I mean, it's, it's very clearly reflected in, when are, do all major neurodevelopmental, uh, when all mental disorders have their onset? Somewhere around this period, right? Somewhere around the end of adolescence, beginning of adulthood. So um, I think I think all of that shows that it's extremely important to learn more about uh, about youth mental health. Um, and there is also something very silly going on in in research and that's this 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 stupid di division between adult and youth uh, you know there's this, this oh 18 let's study let's study mental health and then you only include participants above 18 which is i have no idea where this where this where this uh, border came from but it, it makes no sense in terms of of uh, understanding uh, biomedicine in general yeah, I don't understand that either. <laughs> because uh, isn't it true that the brain only stops, you know, being so plastic at 25? You're now again just putting like a, a, a artificial one on, right? 25? No. Yeah. I, I know what you're saying. I, it, it's absolutely true that certain brain measures, they kind of flatten out. Okay, if, if, you, if you look at... Uh, amount of gray matter volume, amount of white matter, etc. There, there's all these curves that happen, and they first go down, 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 and then they go down less. And indeed, one of the points you can kind of draw with gray matter volume, I think, is at 25, it kind of starts flattening out. But you know, just because a measure of volume flattens out doesn't exactly mean that you know it's the end of our brain growth development degeneration, whatever, all these processes, they are, you know, continuous. Uh, yeah. So now challenging a bit your comment on splitting the, you know, ages and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, would you agree that maybe the youth and younger, uh, younger adults, adolescents, ch uh, children, would maybe need uh, support in more specific ways? Maybe that's why they split it? Like, what's your take on that? Oh, but, yeah, yeah, there, there's absolutely no, there's obviously good reasons to make groups, as in, as in, of course, you need to focus your resources on people and people are across their lifespan, they are more sensitive to different aspects they need, they have different needs. I mean, uh, you're not gonna, screen people for Alzheimer's when they're 10 because you know it, it makes no sense so there's always choices to be made you you're not you can't study the entire population so you focus on certain phases and in those phases there are things where people are more and that have, that have more needs so no I, of course I fully agree that we need to have focus in that sense but I see yeah they're, they're a bit uh, yeah you need you need to know what to do with resources so you need to make choices and choices can be you know sometimes need to be binary yeah yeah for sure thank you so much uh amira do you have any questions uh, uh, how many percentage of the mental health disorder now are uh, partly responsible uh, by the genes according to you and your research Right, so so you're talking about heritability, basically. What, what, what's the heritability of, of, of disorders? Heritability is... Uh, is uh, the, uh, sorry? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, heritability. Sorry, to, yeah. maybe maybe that's a bit of jargon. Uh, heritability is the amount of variation. That's that's. I don't want to go into statistics. Uh, is is what proportion of behavior can you explain by your genes? Yes. Um, if you are talking about broad sense heritability, so anything that can be explained by genes, it tends to be. 60, 70, 80 percent of, of these neurodevelopmental disorders. With schizophrenia, it's it's around 75 percent. Uh, autism is also in there. Major depression is a bit lower. It's around 40. Um, ADHD is around 70. Yeah, they're, they're high. They're absolutely high. But you do have to uh, understand that that part of that is what we call gene environment interactions, right? So if you if you are more sensitive to stress due to your genes that gets put into that heritability component. Um, what we call uh, SNP-based heritability, so only uh, main effects, then you're usually at about half that. About 30% of your genes, just purely your genes, determine whether you have, for instance, ADHD or not. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. Yeah, Putting absolutely. that component aside, like the her herd, I can't pronounce the word, but you know things that go from the your ancestors to you. Mm -hmm. um, what impact, like, has your research shown of the like the environment has on mental health in young people? Does that make sense? I mean, I, th I think we have to think more in terms of what is modifiable. I think I think environmental factors do tend to have... Okay, there are a few components to this. First off, environmental factors tend to have bigger effects than, than uh, genetic factors. So because genetic factors, you have, you have, you know, you have th millions of genetic variants and they all have a tiny 0.000% effect on your, on your outcome, whereas an environmental factor such as, you know, the amount of psychosocial stress you've had, they have... Um, you know, if, if you've had 10 times more stress than, than someone else, you have a 10 times bigger chance of developing a disorder. I mean, it's, they have bigger effects. Um, so that's an important factor why, why we definitely still need to look at the environment, even though all these genes are so, all these factors are so highly heritable. Um, and very importantly, you can modify the environment, right? I mean, you, you, Influencing your genes, it's, it's going to be very tricky, but influencing the environment, that's uh, possible. So I think, yeah, the, the environment is an important factor in determining mental health, even though genes, if you would be able to explain everything, genes may have a higher percentage, but uh, modifiable factors, that's why environment is, is so important. Thank you so much. And... Now thinking, so the environment has so much impact, as you're saying, um, what would be um, something that we can change easily in, in our environment uh, to maybe better our mental health? So we're in cities or we are in rural, rural areas or we have a lot of green or not so much green around us, you know, um, what would be good for us to do? Yeah, this, this is a trick question. I mean, I can I can list not even that good, but I can list some some environmental factors that are known to correlate with mental health. But you know, I use the word correlate uh, because you know you, you don't just decide to change your environment. It's not that easy to change your environment, is it? Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's the obvious ones, right? The stress in whatever form. Uh, if it becomes impactful, is bad for your for for your mental health. Uh, urbanicity is bad. So so so, living in 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 major cities tend to correlate with with risk for mental uh, mental illness. But measures like that, I do think we have to become more fine grained because urbanicity is, is is what is urbanicity it is not that you live in a, a big city that's bad for you it is something about the big city right it's 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 uh, that you see more crime in the street that you have a less sense uh, less less a safe feeling in the street or something so um yeah we can list environmental factors that's 
possible. I mean, you can just go on Google Scholar, I guess, and find what what are the environmental factors that that correlate with uh, with with uh, with mental illness. But I think it's also more important to again come back to the modifiable factors. If I just think of, if you ask me, what can we do to improve our mental health? Go out for a run. Um, you know, go 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 into nature. Um, do sports. Do some sort of um, mindfulness. I, um, I I really like mindfulness uh, training. That's that's uh, you know being in a moment, learning to be in a moment. That's 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 uh, environmental influences. You can you can. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very uh, easy way to change the environment. So you're uh, inside your house, and then you go out to, for a run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you mentioned mindfulness and that you do that. How, in what way have you noticed that it helps? Because it's such a trendy topic nowadays. Uh, yeah, so does yeah. it really work? How do you do it? Does it have an impact? Honestly, this this is completely outside my research, right? This, but not that it matters, but this is not something I know exactly what brain pathways are involved or what but no, um, I'm yeah, from a personal experience so you're a normal person you're not a researcher you using mindfulness i'm a normal person okay uh, good um but that's um mindfulness yeah i've, I've started doing that uh, a little while back and i've noticed that i i did tend to be yes a researcher kind of a cold researcher that doesn't like the floaty bits and yet i started trying mindfulness and i thought it was surprising how much it helped me to be in the moment to to um, also outside the actual mindfulness training be more focused throughout the day to uh, be happier actually to to appreciate what you have and uh, and and uh, enjoy the moment rather than you know always always being busy in your mind like uh, oh what do i need to do next what what uh, what's going wrong what can be better etc no being in a moment that's a very important factor of being happy and for that reason also mentally healthy thank you so that was the answer i wanted <laughs> thank you i can recommend it for everyone right i i realized that while we're talking about mental health we almost entirely always go into mental illness, right? We, we have this, this thing where we always talk about negative aspects of it, but stuff like mindfulness, that does the opposite, right? It goes into mental health rather than mental illness. I think that's, that's what we need to talk about more as well. So I, I don't know what the other people will talk about today, but I really hope that you can also push them to talk a bit more about mental health, not mental ill health and and talk how you can achieve that because again for instance yeah i do mindfulness i i consider myself a reasonably healthy person but that doesn't mean that i should not focus on becoming even more healthy that's a great point you, know, you made focusing on how to improve mental health and health and not just talking about mental illness that's a yeah. great point. Yeah, yeah. they are it, it seems nuanced but it is something different right it, uh, Factors that cause mental illness may not be the same factors that improve mental health. That's uh, I'm, I'm starting to realize it a bit more. That's very interesting and so true. Do you want to develop on that? Actually, yeah, you know, I, it, there's a reason why it's in my mind. There's indeed a, a new research line that I'm kind of looking into. It's called uh, resilience, uh, resilience research uh, as well. That that. Um, there are plenty of factors that make people more resilient. So, so some people that that experience stress do not develop mental illness, right? They they they, they uh, are more resilient, and I think that's a very interesting research. We all focus constantly again, even our conversation, right? Was constantly about risk factors, what risk factors did, what, but um, there's also a whole different component, uh, resilience, as in what what keeps people healthy. Um, and I think from a biological perspective, that makes a lot of sense. If people um, have different, um, I don't know how deep I should go into biology, but we have this, we have this, uh, it's called the HPA axis. The, uh, we, only, we only have five minutes. Okay. So <laughs> no, I don't no, know no, how much deep you want to go into biology. No, it's, okay. I, I just meant that there are differences in our uh, 
systems that determine how we react to stress. But I, yeah, I'll stay away from the from the biology then. No. no, but please still answer the question. I just don't want you to get uh, uh, deep into technical stuff. Sure, but um, no, I'll, again, I'll just round off that there are factors that determine how well we are doing, not necessarily how bad we are doing. Um, certain the, the way people's serotonin systems work versus the, versus others, how much of a boost they get uh, in certain certain neurotransmitters when they see something. It, it all influences how reactive they are to the environment, and for that sense, how sensitive they are to good impulses or bad impulses. Thank you so much, uh, Amira. Do you have any other questions for these last few minutes? Um, no, everything has already been response. Uh, so, thank you, thank you, Denis. Was amazing. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so, you've talked about mindfulness. So, in three minutes, can you say another thing that you do that helps you with your mental health? I think I also already mentioned that. We've been very efficient, right? Uh, but I've, I've also already mentioned sports. I like I like I like uh, going out. I like uh, going to uh, going for cycling, going for running. And I think I, I challenge everyone that is feeling bad to go for a run and you know still feel as bad when when you come. That's easy to say though, right? If you if you you know the lack of motivation that you have, but but really. Just maybe go for a walk, and you may feel a bit better after walk. And if you try running, you'll feel a bit better as well. It it is amazing. We can. It's kind of hacking your your biology and going for a run. It's 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 amazing what it can do for your mental health. That's awesome. Um, what other activities, like instead of running and walking, for example, for someone who is disabled? What can they do besides mindfulness? God, that's a good question. <laughs> we need more research. That's always my beautiful escape route, right? We need more research, uh, which I hope to do with uh, in, in, in youth gems and an environmental project. Yeah, uh, more for for disabled. I mean, yeah, you would still like to have physical physical movement, right? So yeah, it depends on how disabled they are, I guess. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't. No, no, no. It is. It really depends on the type of disability or disabilities a person has. But but yeah, I just wanted to mention that bit. Um, not everyone can go on a walk or, or on a run, but like right. you mentioned, sometimes just a little bit of movement is helpful. Also, maybe talk about exercise. Um, but see, this, this is exactly why we need, uh, I, I want to end with uh, mentioning what the great job you guys do as in, uh, so, so we met right last week at, uh, at the Youth Gems, another uh, project on, on youth mental health. And I just want to say, I really appreciate what you guys did there. You, you sat with us, brainstormed with us, and you really steered uh, the conversation, you really steered as in how we're gonna do research. And I thought that was amazing. So. Uh, yeah, time is up. I just want to end with saying that um, I'm really happy to be involved with you guys. And, and, and I could see the benefits of having more youth representation in these, uh, in these science projects. You need to be told what, to, what is important to you. And, uh, that was great. So thank you. Thank you for coming. And thank you so much for talking with us and chatting with us. You've been very helpful. Your input has helped us a lot. And... We've been having a lot of fun with all of the guests. Guests, yes, plural. Um, so um, thank you for coming. And we're now gonna go to another break and we'll be back at 5 p.m. with another guest. So stay tuned and thank you so much. Thank you, Dan.
uh, welcome back. Uh, so welcome. I'm going to hand the 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 lead to you. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Ines. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, now we're going to receive Cassie Redlich that work uh, as a technical officer in the mental health at the WHO. Welcome, Cassie. Thank you so much. How, How are, are you are doing? You? Hey, we're welcome. Yeah, we're good. Great. We're excited. So um, I'm going to ask you, Cassie, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, where are you from? Where do you live? So my name is Cassie Redlick. Um, I am from Australia originally. So you, you might be able to hear in the accent, but I actually, actually live in Copenhagen in Denmark, which is where I am right now. Okay, great. Uh, can you also tell us about uh, your job? What are you doing at the WH? Yeah, sure. So I'm a technical officer in mental health uh, at the WHO at our regional office for Europe. So we have a, a big regional office in, um, in Copenhagen in Denmark, and I work within our mental health flagship team. Um, and my responsibilities in the team are pretty broad. They're mental health across the life course, but that includes mental health of, of children, adolescents, and young people. Amazing. Um, uh, to start a, a question, uh, I'm interested to know, how did you get into psychology and uh, mental health? I know that you you are a, a clinical psychologist, or you work uh, in the uh, you study psychology before, and you did the master in public health. How did so, you get into that? Yeah. So I'm actually a clinical social worker, and I, my my original training was in social work, and um, I worked in Australia where I where I did my my first training in community mental health services. So my whole career has been in, in mental health and actually for, for all my clinical career, I was in, um, in working with young people. So 15 to, to 25 year olds um, in community-based settings. Uh, so I, um, so I, as I said, I trained in social work and then I did extra training in other sort of psychological interventions and then did a graduate program in mental health and then kept going from there. And uh, how did you apply your previous experience working in mental health and uh, uh, at the WHO? Yeah, good question. So um, I guess my um, about six or seven years into working uh, in my clinical career, I thought that I actually was really interested in sort of bigger issues, systems and, um, and how we could improve services and the different components of the service system and how they hang together. Um, and also I was interested in sort of not only services and, and, um, and, and interventions in a clinical sense, but also in mental health promotion and prevention. So I went um, overseas. I actually went to Sweden and, and did a master's in public health. And while I was over here, I did um, an internship at WHO, and that was the first time I got involved in this kind of um, uh, public mental health. And uh, I, and, you know, so now I've been doing that for 10 years, but I feel like I still apply all the work that I did and all the training that I had in social work in my work every day, really. And increasingly so, I think that sort of, um, you know, we're, we're moving increasingly into thinking about um, within the mental health field, about well-being, about mental health promotion, prevention, um, about community-based settings. Um, and that's the, that, that, those are the things that I learned about as a social worker and thinking about how you really engage communities in, in um, improving people's lives. And so I feel like I actually apply it all the time and increasingly so. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. Um, you have been working more than 10 years uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that field. What is the biggest improvement uh, on mental health you have seen in this period? Mm. And how yeah, I, I think it's that change. I think that when I started out, really, we were very, especially starting out at WHO, we were quite narrowly focused as a mental health unit our, our, our units were focused very much on thinking about um, mental health treatment, um, mental health services, uh, things that happen in, in hospitals and clinical settings. And those things are really important. You know, I think it's really important that we continue to improve services um, and make sure that um, we're providing good, high quality care when people need it. But, you know, what we also need to do is think about the things that we can do to make sure people don't ever need services if we can. So, so thinking about um, the social and structural determinants of mental health and the different sort of um, mechanisms that um, exist that can help to improve people's mental health and well-being. And that is now most of the work. I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, that's that's more of the work now, um, thinking about promotion prevention activities, thinking about well-being, um, thinking about the types of activities and interventions and the type of structures that, that, that we can um, use to improve people's well-being. Um, so I think that's been huge, an enormous change. And then, of course, I think, you know, the, the um, getting young people involved, I think this is a perfect example of thinking of, of seeing how things have changed that um, when I started out, you know, it was right at the beginning in Australia of thinking about getting young people involved in designing the services that, that they were using, making sure that services and supports were actually sort of meeting their needs and things that they actually wanted to, 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 to use. Um, and, uh, and so that has only exploded. I think that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not an option anymore, really, that, that we can't go ahead without thinking about involving the people who, um, who we're trying to improve services for, improving them in the process of doing that. So that's really exciting as well, I think. Thank you so much. Yes, it is very exciting. And if you don't mind me asking, um, how do you see, uh, Cassie, uh, how do you see youth, um, you know, when you work with them? And I would love, love to know how you get involved with youth and how do you see them? You see them as partners, you see them as co-researchers, co-producers, you know, I'd love to hear about that. Well, I think, I mean, it's been different in different settings that I've worked with. Um, and I think at the moment, what we're doing at WHO is really starting a process. You know, we're, we're an organisation where, um, you know, really our main focus has been working with our, um, our primary stakeholders, our member states. So that's our, our ministries of health in all the countries that we work in. Um, and we're increasingly... Uh, realizing that in order to implement some of the things that we 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 want to implement in in countries and communities, that we actually need broader stakeholders around the table, and so we're really just now starting to think about what it looks like to bring young people um, into those discussions. So we we've just recently launched this thing called the the Pan European Mental Health Coalition, and and it really is. Uh, it's an acknowledgement that we, we need different people around the table. We need our member states and our ministries of health that we work with still, but we also need different stakeholders if we're going to um, really accelerate change and and bring about some of the impact that we that we want. So we've got researchers, we've got people from non-government organisations, we've got civil society, we've got individuals that have just put up their hand and really want to be involved, and we've got young people amongst that group um, so that's one way that we're doing it thinking about young people as sort of equal partners in a coalition of a whole lot of really very diverse stakeholders 
And for us, it's about making sure that everyone in that room, including those young people, feel safe to be able to put forward their opinions and to be heard. And, you know, because there are a, there's a lot of power differential within rooms like that, a lot of it, it's um, we, 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 we need to make sure that we're, we're providing a safe space for everyone to participate. And I think beyond that, it's about all the products that we develop. You know, we, we're an organisation that develop guide, guidelines and policies and tools to support implementation of policy. And so we need to increasingly be thinking about getting really good representation in, in, in the in, inputs into those, um, into those products and those tools, anything that we're producing really. And so thinking about making sure that we're in, we have sort of different mechanisms for getting young people involved in the design development of those, those tools as early as we can. Um, in other settings, you know, that I've worked in, it's been about bringing young people into the research pro process and that's really exciting as well, I think. And, and then also in the actual delivery of services and supports, which again is, you know, in, in the sort of involving young people as peer workers and mentors. And so there's, there's so many opportunities. It's, it's, it's pretty exciting. And certainly at WHO at the moment, I think this is just the start of something that will continue to develop over time um, as, as we get better at doing it and young people tell us what we're getting wrong and what we're getting right. Thank you so much. Amira, <laughs> go ahead. Um, did you notice any difference uh, in the youth mental health between Australia and uh, Europe? Hmm. Um, do you mean in terms of young people's actual mental health? Uh, their their experience of mental health and well-being. But sorry, I can you repeat because it was cut uh, by internet. Uh huh. Um, no, I was just wondering. Do 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 you mean um, the the experience of young people in terms of how they their mental health is, or about the sort of structures around them? Or both, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, it was more both like the structure, uh, yeah. more about the structure and uh, the the policy, maybe. And yeah, um, I think it really varies. You know, Australia it's a very big continent. It's a big country, um, but it is one country. And even though the sort of experience across the country in terms of, you know, the supports that are available, um, the services that are available, the quality of those services, it does differ. But ultimately, you know, it's it's um, it's a, it's a narrow range. But Europe, there's so many countries, so many different settings, so many contexts um, that you know what what's normal in one country in terms of the services that you might expect to be provided for young people that can be completely different across a border. Um, and so I guess for me, it's about this sort of great diversity is, is the biggest difference um, between Australia and, and Europe. Um, I think Australia has a long history of youth mental health services and early intervention services. And, and we've for a long time now, you know, almost 20 years, we've um, we've been involving young people in in um, mental health services and supports. But you know, that doesn't mean that we've got it right. That I think every country, every setting can always do better. There's there's lots to learn always, and it sort of goes in cycles. And and increasingly in Australia, young people are really um, they're they're moving into positions where they have a, a, a lot of power to, to, to shape what some of the services look like and that's wonderful and that's also happening in lots of parts of Europe but we need to get everyone up to that <laughs> to that place I think and that's that's the challenge in such a diverse setting as Europe. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, uh, which group is the most important target regarding to mental health policy from WHO is that the youth 
and why is that in targeting policy so i just missed your question there is it the most important group for targeting policy which group yeah. which group which is group? exactly uh, um regarding the mental health policy in who which group like uh is that the youth um adult old people uh and why this group well i mean i think we um you know we we try to work at the highest level and then think about you know sort of we we need to to try and think always about improving mental health sort of structures and systems for everyone um but then obviously we have some key priorities um you know and that um at the moment for us one of the one of our key priority areas is in youth mental health um making sure that uh you know young people from children up to older adults that there are services and structures in place to support them because we know that young people have had such a difficult time throughout covid um you know that's playing out in the data now we see that young people are disproportionately affected um so young people are, are within our current um mental health framework for action we have a um a european framework for action on mental health which guides all the work that we do and young people a particular priority area there but also um mental health of older adults is another priority area um you know again it's about making sure that um that older adults don't fall through the cracks and and again covid has really impacted on older adult mental health and so it's another priority area for us um but i guess what we try to think about you know we have these areas of priority but we also try to think about it as a continuum you know we want to make sure that across the life force that um there are structures and services in place to support people so that you know from the time that you're born through to the time when you're getting into older adulthood that um there are the all those different risk and protective factors across the life course are being addressed so it's about <laughs> everything and then also some particular pockets where we think it's important to sort of really um prioritize work at the moment thank you very much uh, ines do you have any question for our guests yeah, so thank you so much for uh, your answer, Cassie. Uh, I would love to ask you if you feel comfortable sharing, um, does any of your lived experience, particularly mental health, uh, have it, has it ins inspire you in any way in the work you do? Yeah, in lots of different ways. You know, I think I, I have um, a sibling of mine who has had experiences of um, quite serious mental health problems throughout his life. And he's quite a bit older than me. So when I was younger, that was very confusing. And, you know, I think it was probably one of the, the reasons that I was attracted to, to working in mental health, just to sort of find out more about what was going on, because then we didn't really talk about it as a community and not, not in the ways that we, we do now. I mean, there's still a long way to go, but I think it's much more, it's much easier now to find out information when you need it. And and back then, I, I didn't really know what was going on for him at times when he was unwell. So I think it was probably um, the reason I first got into this area. Um, you know, I think also that, you know, as we're, we're human beings and we experience, um, all the the emotions and the stressors that go that you know impact us throughout our lives and uh so that certainly you know the work i do makes me hyper aware of where you know where i might be feeling particularly stressed and need to look after myself more i think you know it's um we're often the ones working in mental health that don't look after ourselves so well but I think certainly within the, the teams that I've worked with, I've had amazing colleagues where we've been really good. I think it's sort of um, ensuring that we're we're looking after ourselves and and being mindful of when our when you know we need to 
practice more self care. Um, uh, and, you know, and that's, it, it's, it's just something that, you know, I think has, has been built in throughout my, my career. But, um, yeah, you know, and I think we all have experiences in our lives of our friends and our family going through difficult times. And um, it's, it's, it's just part of being human. So it impacts me in lots of ways all the time. And, and <laughs> to answer your question. Thank you so much. And yeah. hearing you say that, I would like to ask you, so what are some ways that uh, you do self-care in order to maybe maintain or uh, better your mental health? So we had a very big year because I moved my family all the way across the world about six months ago. And so we, I was very mindful that that was a really stressful experience. And so we we decided as a family to to make sure that we got into some good, some good habits um, from the start <laughs> so that we were protecting our mental health and keeping our stress levels down. And so one thing that I do at the moment, which I have never actually done in the past, but which I get my five-year-old son to do with me every weekend is to go walking. We don't have a dog ourselves, but we have a neighbour, <laughs> an elderly neighbour who has a very, very energetic dog. And so we walk him every weekend, every Saturday and Sunday morning. I take my son and we go for a very long walk with the dog. <laughs> and it's a really nice way just to um, put all the other things aside. <laughs> you have to focus on, on the dog. He's quite excitable. So we focus on our job of getting the dog walked and we get to talk in the process. Um, and it's a really nice time given, you know, we're, I'm very busy and um, he's at school. So it's a nice opportunity to be able to talk about the week and also to just um, get out in the fresh air and move and, you know, focus on things other than all the stressful things that go on during the week. So that's been really nice. For me, it's, a, it's generally about sort of movement and making sure that I'm doing enough exercise to, um, you know, to, to, feel, to feel good and strong and, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Amira, uh, do you want to maybe read the question that's on the chat? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we have a question from Alejandra. Uh, how do you think that pets, as you mentioned, the dog, uh, can benefit the mental health of children and ad adolescents? Well, my experience is that it's it's very powerful. I think, you know, there there are lots of ways that pets are helpful. You know, it's, as I said, you know, one part is just they force you to get exercise, to get out, to get out of bed, to get sunshine, to get exercise, to move. Um, they force you to be out in nature. We know that's good for people's mental health to be, it's certainly where I live, we get to walk in the park um, through, you know, really beautiful landscape. Um, it's, it's, it's a very relaxing, calm environment, um, despite the energy of our, of our neighbor's dog. Um, you know, and it's about the connection as well. I mean, you know, uh, for us, I mean, it connects us as a family. So um, it's a nice way to build in connection and, no, for others, I, I mean, I think the that that pets in general, animals, the the it, it's it's the, a a connection that 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 provides uh, a lot of um yeah, a lot of satisfaction and joy to people. So it's it makes good intuitive sense that it would be good for our mental health. Um, and you know, I think I watch my child, who's only five, also looking up. We are experiencing some technical difficulties again. I hope to get our guests back in just a moment. Um, but thank you so much for everyone who's asking questions in the comments. They're, we really want to hear uh, from you guys. So Cassie, uh, you were saying about... Our guest is back. Yeah, do you want to say about... Um, Welcome back, Cassie. 
<laughs> Hello. Hey, uh, you want to keep an answering the question? Yeah. So I'm not sure how much of that you got, but uh, yeah, you can start at the I beginning. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I think there are just so many ways. I mean, for us, it's been it's certainly been about getting out. It forces us to get out and and to walk and to get fresh air and to have quality time with our little family. Um, you know, it's uh, it's. I see my son take responsibility for a dog, and it's one of the first times that he's ever sort of felt that he has a responsibility to look after the dog and you can see that he's sort of how empowering it is for him to take on that responsibility and to um and uh and it's just a, such a satisfaction for him so um yeah you know I think that it, it's there, there are so many ways that pets help us in our, our mental health um, and and certainly my experience has, has been all positive. This is the first time we've ever had a dog and I think we're we're quite addicted now to our Saturday and Sunday walks. It's um it's it, it's certainly something that we wouldn't want to give up. Do either of you guys have pets? I have a cat. Uh, actually, no, but my mother does have uh, two cats. Cats I don't know about. I've never had a cat in my life. They don't seem to like me very much, but I know that people love their cats a lot. We only have two minutes uh, left. Um, would you like to add some input, uh, Cassie? Do you have? Have uh, any uh, other things that you want to add before we end in these two minutes? I just really want to say thanks so much. This has been such a great event. I can imagine you guys must be so tired from interviewing people all day, but you know what a wonderful way to spend World Mental Health Day. It's uh, it's such a great thing. To be doing and it's it's been such a, a pleasure to come and talk about some of the work that we're doing um so so thank you so much pleasure a pleasure sharing thank thank you a lot cassie for uh, uh your experience um oh yeah we have alejandra that answering you uh, i don't have a pet but i would love to adopt a dog when i'm ready to take up that responsibility <laughs> i'd highly recommend yeah. <laughs> Thank you a lot, Cassie. Uh, we wish you the best and uh, and uh, thank you for participating to this talk. Uh, we're coming back in 10 minutes. We have 10 minute break and the uh, next guest will be Simona Carbonaris. Uh, so we'll see you in 10 minutes. Uh, thank you everyone for participating. Have a good day.
Hello, everyone. We are back to the stream live. Um, we are now going to start uh, the new session with uh, Simona. Uh, Simona, uh, that is um, a researcher in the Center for Social Innovation. Welcome, Simona. Hi, Simona. Hi, all. How are you? Good, good, very good. I'm listening to your nice interviews. Very, very well done. Um, do you agree to uh, introduce yourself? Uh, where do you live? Where are you from? And what are you doing? Yes, thank you. So yes, my name is Simona Carvonieris. I'm uh, based in uh, the Netherlands in a place called Utrecht. Um, quite near Amsterdam, a little bit below. And I'm um, working as a researcher mainly and lecturer at uh, one of the universities over here. Um, I'm, I'm based at uh, the social sciences, social work department, and I'm doing, um, focusing mainly on, on a PhD research about lived experiences, um, which I also have myself. So I'm also um, uh, a user, service user in mental health. Um, yeah, so that's um, actually what I do. Thank you, Simona. Um, Amazing. Uh, go on, Nick. Yes, so um, just I, I'm taking over from Inesh from, for a bit, just to let everyone know. You know, she'll be back soon. She she's doing the full session more or less today. So uh giving her a well deserved break. Simona, lovely to see you. So um yeah, thanks for introducing yourself. Um so it's great to have you on, obviously. And I guess one of the main reasons we wanted to invite you on today is to talk about some of the work you're doing, particularly around um youth mental health uh, and youth co-production. Um so can you maybe share with the audience? Uh, about maybe some of the projects and work that you're currently doing or exci currently excited about, let's say. Yeah. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm still finishing a PhD that is uh, focusing on the lived experiences of me uh, professionals working in mental health. Um, because um, as not always uh, known, uh, a lot of professionals up to 75 percentage has uh, lived ex have lived experiences themselves. Uh, so we're talking about disruptive life events, about trauma uh, of any kind of any kind of uh, sorts. Um, and those professionals were trained not to use those lived experiences, and it's exactly what I try to um, work on. Um, so we're training the professionals to use their lived experiences in an adequate manner. And uh, that, that is uh, my PhD. But what I'm also uh, very eager to start up with is the Youth Gems project. I think Dennis van der Meer already mentioned that uh, and introduced it. So we're also involved in that uh, research project. And like I think he mentioned, it's a, a five year running project on the genetics and the environmental factors influencing mental health of children and youth in the age of um, uh, 12 till 26, approximately. Um, and we are involved specifically in the engagement of youngsters themselves. So we don't wanna, we'd rather not talk about them, with, but with them in this project. Um, yeah, so it's very exciting. And why did you get involved uh, with the youth, mental health youth especially? Well, it's actually, I came across this project when I talked with Jim, Jim van Os. Uh, he's a well-known uh, psychiatrist here in the Netherlands, and he has been um, putting effort to, um, to make collaborations and connections in between social sciences, the medical science, um, and mental health, which are not always... Um, um, there, so they should be, but it, it's often quite divided, the field, so we're trying to put things together, actually.
Okay, um, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it, thank you for that. I guess it's an interesting one what you talk about, Simona, in your PhD about, um, if I can ask you a bit about that, about mm -hmm. professionals and their lived experiences of, of mental health. And I wonder in the links between the, you, you know, you know, be part of this Youth Gems project and working specifically with youth and, and service users and young people with lived experience. Um, and then looking at the, the professionals that work with maybe said young people. And um, as a youth worker, it's something we, there was always, there's always debate in youth work around how much of yourself you share and, and, and use as a potentially a tool to engage and bond with a, a person you're trying to support and work with. And there's a fine line. Um, I guess, but my question is, what um, is that? Has have you noticed any um, in your PhD? I guess mainly, is there? Have you noticed? I don't know any trends around the kind of young professional kind of. Uh, is it people that have already got lived experience as a teenager wanting to give back and therefore go into the profession of some form of mental health nurse or psychologist or psychiatrist, or is it that they go into the profession? And it's during that time that maybe onset difficulties arise, shall we say, as, as was the case for me. Actually. Well, I'd argue that if I went to adopters when I was younger, they might have said something, but, <laughs> but I didn't know, know anything. Yeah. About them, okay. as an adult. Yeah. Yeah. So we see different uh, entrances, so to say. Uh, we see people who are struggling from an early age on and, well, uh, of course, like around 17, 18 uh, is the age that a lot of problems uh, kind of become visible. But I believe that in most of the cases th they were already there, you know, it's just becoming more visible, visible, sorry. Um, so we have professionals who have been coping for quite some time and are also uh, finding their ways to manage. Um, and, and they really are attracted to the field, uh, probably because of their own uh, experiences. Uh, but we also see professionals who were not really, um, uh, they, they, they were motivated to work in this field, but not from a pers personal perspective. And then they got ill or they got burned out um, and they return in a totally different manner. So, yeah, <laughs> that you're, you're the, the, the latter, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I guess, and sadly, no explicit uh, answer. Not that there was ever going to be one of that. Okay, I'm going to disappear and bring Inesh back into the room so that young people, it is more led by young people. I know I look you and everyone, but sadly, I'm almost 40. Um, but Simona, lovely to see you. Inesh. Yes, you great. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, and Nick, you do look young. <laughs> <laughs> so hey uh glad to Hi. see you um so from what i hear and your participation in youth gems i would love to ask you um what do you think um kind of systemic change that needs to happen in order for mental health to be put as a priority in everyone's eyes? Wow, gosh, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I think we can use investments on different layers, probably. But one of them uh, that is also uh, an aim in this project is to work on prevention, so early detection. Um, and really seeing the young people that are struggling um, and intervening earlier, maybe by, uh, you know, um, uh, communicating with their parents or support system or schools. So there are all kind of different ways to uh, reach out, but I definitely feel that we need early interventions and not always high professional interventions but low threshold interventions um for starters actually yeah and that's also what we would like to do in this project um so there's a technical side on this pro project but there's also the social side of the pro this project 
And uh, as I am in the lead of the social part, uh, we would like to organize like science cafes in which youngsters can participate and make explicit what their ideas are and feedback on the, the technical and clinical part of the studies. Um, uh, be part of a reflection advisory group, um, co-creating things like e-health and apps. Um, think about the ethical parts of the study and research and such. So really from, from the beginning, like usually in research, yeah, you kind of, well, what, what I'm used uh, to is that researchers in the end kind of think of, oh, how, how does, how would this be, you know, and what would be the felt sense of our findings for the target group? But I think that's uh, too late. We want participation from the beginning and we want uh, youngsters to be part of this as co-researchers and young advisors uh, and really co-create together with the researchers that are, um, are interested in all these specifically uh, areas, sorry, specific areas. Yeah. Thank you so much. Amira, would you like to ask a question? Um, yes, uh, Simona, if you are okay to, to answer this um are you wanting to share with the audience any personal uh, circumstances that you uh, may have inspired uh, uh, that may have inspired you at all about mental health yes yes definitely so uh i am familiar with trauma and dissociation myself um, I, I've had quite a, a difficult, uh, well, yeah, quite a difficult youth. Uh, was living with my mom, um, only my mom, and my dad was not present. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone from outside would say immediately, oh, that's trauma. Because back then, even for me, it was not noticeable that, you know, uh, things that I was struggling so um, I ended up uh, having a lot of um, um, attachment figures at school, like um, a teacher would be really someone uh, important to me that could provide something that was lacking at home. Um, and I think um, sometimes people associate trauma with something that has been done to you, like violence or sexual abuse, which are all forms of trauma, definitely. But trauma is also something that was not there that you needed. Like uh, the emotional, your emotional needs were not met. Um, and I think that society, communi community is becoming more aware of this type of trauma. Uh, and we really need uh, a broader perspective on this. So that, that has been driven me and driving me, sorry, to, um, yeah, to participate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so touching a bit on that, uh, I love that you said that trauma can be s something that was missing. Mm -hmm. So do you want to develop on how uh, maybe there's a preconceived idea, you know, uh, that trauma is something that happens to you instead of something that's missing? Yes. Um, well, it's, it's, so it can be almost anything and it's very subjective. You know, what causes stress can be almost anything. Stress is a subjective uh, experience. And, um, I believe that, um, um, stress that adds up can result, you know, can, um, yeah eventually evolve in psychological distress and mental distress. Um, so yeah, that's what we're looking at. And sometimes it's not even so easy to, to define what's really happening. Um, yeah, but we also definitely want to look into the resilience, you know, people also have resi resiliency um, and and power, a lot of power, actually. So that's also an area I think that needs further exploration in mental health because 
um, a lot of professionals are trained to look at pathology and problems and <laughs> things that are not working right. Um, but we can actually learn a lot, I think, from youngsters who are um, seduced to reflect on what is happening and who are uh, being involved in those reflections themselves so they can learn themselves from it. And also professionals will definitely learn from that, I believe. Thank you so much for that uh, answer. It's really interesting how uh, Dennis was saying this before. We focus a lot of the things that are going wrong and not enough on things that are going right and how they can benefit. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and what I would also like to add is that, um, in at least in the Netherlands, I'm not sure how that works for other countries, but in the Netherlands, we're very cognitively oriented. So a lot of psychotherapies uh, use cognitive therapy elements and don't really pay attention to the body. And I believe that's really a missed opportunity because um, the body tells us so much more like Bessel van der Kolk, of course, well-known uh, uh, person and psychiatrist. Uh, but it's, I think that's actually true that we need to, we need the body. It tells us so much more. Thank you so much. Amira, do you want to ask uh, another question? What systemic change needs to happen in order to put mental health as a priority in people's life? Uh, well, poo, yeah. Um, maybe diversifying uh, our communities. Um, so um, stigma is, of course, still around. Uh, that's there's stigma, I think, in mental health care, but there's also stigma in the community. And this is something I think we need to address um, uh, in order to change systems and systemic um, uh, interactions. So not everyone suits a role or is, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think we really need the, 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 to embrace the diversity. Thank you so much. And how do you see, uh, how can we embrace diversity? Yeah, it starts, I think, with dialogue. Um, so as um, the moment you realize that you have some kind of association or negative idea or you're not really you cannot really um understand someone uh then just talk and ask i think it starts with questioning question just questions um and having a dialogue with people who are perhaps in in a vulnerable position or um are not really seen or are not being involved or are being discriminated. Um, so yeah, for me, it's all about dialoguing. Yeah, dialogue, yeah. communication is a really big thing. And I see why uh, you are on the social part uh, uh, on the Youth Gems project. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah. Yeah, my main uh, area of expertise, um, yeah. But Youth Gems is a huge project. So uh, Dennis already shared some different parts of the project. And maybe in the future, we could invite uh, other researchers uh, from the project to, um, yeah, to further shine a light on the different perspectives. Yeah, for sure. That would be very interesting. Yeah. Amira, would you like to ask another question? What is the biggest improvement you have seen uh, this last year as you have been working in the mental, mental health field? Um, the biggest improvement for me is the awareness about the body, um, 
more body oriented uh, therapies and interventions. I think that's a real improvement like um, sensory motor psychotherapy, somatic experiencing, um, but also trauma sensitive yoga is something that we're setting up here also in the local uh, hospital. So a, a lot of different interventions, but they all are body based basically. And they try to um, integrate um, um, the more cognitive part of therapy into uh, the body that has been, that it also experiences things. Um, because um, we also know that for some, um, the cognition is just, you know, it's it's like a trick. Um, so especially when youngsters are intelligent, they can easily kind of cheat in therapy and say, okay, you know, I'm okay. Uh, but they're actually not. So just uh, paying attention to the felt sense and um, uh, how their their well being actually. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and uh, Dennis only spoke about the environmental project. He didn't really touch much on the Youth Gems project. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what the project is, you know, main points and things like that. Yes. So uh, there are very varying activities uh, running to investigate mental health in uh, youth. And also trauma is one of, one of the uh, focuses in the project um, and it, it varies from um, patient participation uh, to clinical studies to epigenetics and artificial intelligence modeling all kind of activities um, but what we would like to do as i said before is really engaging with young advisors to hear their feedback on all these activities um, to co-create to define what is resilience, what is recovery, what is your discovery, perhaps, um, and eventually also to reduce stigma and discrimination. Thank you so much. Like that, I think it's a really beautiful project, and I'm so glad that you and all the researchers and your youth mental health are part of it and we're all yeah. in this together yeah great yeah we're also still searching uh youngsters yeah so if anyone is not thinking oh this is interesting i'd like to join uh please uh, uh send us an email oh yeah for sure yeah yeah i believe nick will talk about that at some point um great. and now i'm thinking what is for people that don't know uh, what is uh, trauma-centered yoga or based yoga? Trauma-sensitive yoga. Uh, it's it's um, it's actually yoga, but it's practiced in a trauma-sensitive way. So no touchings, uh, very slow. Um, only stay on your own mat. Um, we don't do do any difficult poses. Just very basic. A sequence of yoga to um, check in and tune in with your body to be present uh, with yourself and um, it's actually quite well known but um, it wasn't yet implemented in mental health care uh, until recently in the Netherlands um, but it was developed um, in the US I believe um, and it really, um, yeah, uh, respects all sorts of trauma. So it's it's not trauma focused, but it's trauma sensitive. Awesome. I've I've never um, tried it before. Have you? Uh, yes, um, but uh, that's also because I, I'm a yoga teacher. Um, and I also, uh, I do a lot of yoga, so uh, I really love to try different types of yoga. Um, yeah, and also practice for myself. Uh, I have a mat here <laughs> in my living room um, and, and try to practice as much as I can. 
um, just it's it's almost like a meditation and mindful uh, uh, kind of being with yourself um, and also try to empty your own you know thoughts and head um, that is sometimes uh, yeah you know just the everyday load of activities that are that might be overwhelming you can you know relax a bit from that awesome and so i'm thinking that yoga for you is uh running or walking the dog exactly yes yes and that's i think bessel but also other researchers um mentioned that you can do you can walk the dog you can do tango you can do boxing um gardening is also one of such activities that can really uh, make your mind and body feel peaceful and at ease and for me personally that was yoga but it could have been something different of course yeah uh, thank you so much and uh I would like to ask Amira, you know, uh, if you have any more questions. We only have four minutes, I think, but, you know. Go ahead. Um, no, I don't have any question. Like, uh, it already, already have been answered. Uh, but maybe we can read the comment of Alejandra. Uh, oh, um, oh uh, so Alejandra said... What would you tell as a message of hope to someone that is dealing right now with the PTSD and feels lost and confused with the situation? I think it's always nice to send those messages of hope. For those who don't know, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. Oh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Well, um, I, I would personally say try to find try to do something that makes you feel more at ease and comfortable and that can be almost anything again it can be spending time with a friend but it can also mean you need some um, uh, some quiet time for yourself or take a bath or something that really relaxes you um, and then eventually work on resourcing yourself so maybe um, work on a rep. I'm not sure if that's a familiar term for you, a wellness uh, recovery action plan and sum up and find things that are resourceful for you, which you can always resort to when in case of in case you you need them. Um, but also um, yeah, learning how to uh, see the signals, uh, for yourself and become more self-aware when you're not feeling okay. So oftentimes we cross our own boundaries uh, and we're not aware of them. And then in the end we say, oh, I, I was already not feeling really well, but I wasn't sure what it was. Um, and then when you reflect on it, it, things become more insightful and you kind of realize what happens. So um, yeah. Uh, reflections are always quite helpful uh, with someone you really trust, of course. Um, that can be really helpful. Thank you so much. That answer was so insightful. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. Great. Uh, and Great. talking to us. And Amira, uh, I know you're going to leave now. And Joanna uh, is another co-host that's joining us. So thank you so much for being here, Amira, as well. You, you're amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, too. It was amazing to share this with you. Thank you, uh, Simona. Thank you, Ines. Thank you yeah. both. Great, great event. <laughs> for sure. And for those wondering now how interesting Youth Gems Project is, I believe Nick has been sharing in the comments uh, a link for uh, for you to get involved uh, if you want to. So make sure to check those links and websites and the comments that your youth mental health has been living. Great, uh, so yes. looking forward. 
Yeah, yeah. me too. We're going on a quick break now. I'll see you soon.
Welcome. Uh, so now I am going to call out Joanna, another co-host that's joining us. Hey. Hello. Good afternoon. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanna. I'm uh, joining you from Portugal, from Porto. Uh, and I am, I've been a volunteer in Uriot Mental Health for the past three years. And I'm very glad to be celebrating the World Mental Health Day here with with you and with your youth mental health. Awesome. So why not uh, call Alejandra, uh, our next guest, to the floor? <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hey. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. So uh, would you like to introduce yourself as well? So my name is Alejandra. I volunteer at Tiro Youth Mental Health and currently I'm part of the Board of Trustees. I'm from Spain, but uh, living in Brussels since more than four years. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a bit it. Awesome, Joanna, I'll leave it to you now. Thank you. So for this uh, piece of uh, our afternoon, we decided to have uh, a small round table to exchange a bit our, on our experiences as volunteers, but also as, as young people. So maybe my first question for the two of you, we already said what, how long we've been in your youth mental health, but maybe I would like to ask you, why does it, why did you join or why does it matter to you and to tell us a bit of your uh, journey in your youth mental health, so to say. Um, so, okay, I can start. So, yeah, I joined Little Youth Mental Health, I um, don't know, one year and a half ago or something like that. I don't even remember. Um, yeah, I joined because I'm really interested in the topic of mental health. Also because myself, I, I have a mental disorder. So it gets me also intrigued, like what's happening with me, with my brain and what else can I know about it? No, so I've been really interested in the topic to learn more not only about myself and what I have, but also about any other thing related to mental health, self care, and so on. And I'm also really interested in the political part, in the sense of how can we convince policy policymakers and decision makers that this is important and how to make a change. And yeah, so when I started to hear about the reduced mental health, I thought it was the perfect place for me to start volunteering there. Perfect. Thank you, Ines. Best of course. Um, so I actually, I'm actually not sure how long I've been with the reduced mental health, maybe a year or over a year. Um, but yeah, I joined because I'm already very involved in mental health uh, with the United States because that's where I have more connection. But I really wanted to go um, more into European politics and really get connected into European projects. And I found a youth mental health. And I decided, well, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So why not? Perfect. I see in the in the comments we also have Nikki, who is also a member of your youth mental health. Hello, Nikki, and thank you for being there. Uh, for me, um, my journey started when I was in an event uh, for for young organizations uh, or youth organizations. Some of them young, some not so young. Uh, of the European Parliament, and I heard about your youth mental health, and a bit like you were saying, Alejandra, I was curious, like, what is being done? Who are who are these people? What do they do? Uh, and so I couldn't uh, resist joining. And I guess a question I could, uh, that I'm curious to know for you, is like, if you would have, um, let's say, a magic uh, power, and you could change one thing, one policy for mental health for young people in Europe, what would it be? Um, for sure, making it more accessible is definitely not accessible for specifically for young people, because in many cases you can like you're studying, um, you're, you don't have the economical uh, situation to 
to afford even your studies, you need to work on the side of that, or you have a scholarship or something like that. And the access to mental health is is not is a privilege, unfortunately, uh, to mental health care. Sorry. So um, so yeah, definitely the accessibility that that it has right now for young people. Thank you, Ines. Would you have another? Would you create another magical policy? Or? No, I. When you asked that, I was like, no, that's it. That's exactly what Alejandra said. Really making it more accessible. And I mean, people don't really like to talk much about finances and money, but it, it really is. Some people don't have the uh, financial ability to pay for therapy. And so. I think therapists uh, should not receive less money. I think the solution could be maybe this, the government would give a subsidy. I'm not sure if that's the word in English um, to families uh, to apply on their health and specifically mental health. Yeah, I, I also agree with the two of you. I think it's a uh, it's a big issue that you have to choose sometimes between paying for your rent or paying for your uh, mental health care. And that leads people to not seek help, to think that mental health is a privilege or, you know, I, I've i heard things like, oh, you know, um, mental health is for rich people. They get depression because they don't know what to do with so much money. So they spend it on therapists. Um, and it's funny, but it's also kind of sad that someone would think that um, looking after your well-being is uh, a luxury that only people who have nothing better to do uh, can have. Uh, so I think we definitely need to, we, it, like you were saying, Ines, I think we're often scared of saying, like, we need money for this, but we do because it's not uh, accessible. So thank you. I think we are all like, we could join all our magic powers and... Um, do it together. Uh, I also have another curiosity. So both of you have been advocating for mental health for young people for a while. Uh, what are one or several things that surprised you on the road? So when you started, you had no idea or you expected something different. What surprised you in this, uh, let's say, activism uh, world or maybe something that you encountered that was unexpected? I'm not sure if unexpected, but uh, something that surprises me somehow is the lack of knowledge and education that there is around regarding mental health. When people just say things like, I don't have mental health, for example, it's like, no, well, I mean, you have mental health as you have physical health, maybe better or worse, but you do have it because you're a human being. So... And I don't blame the individuals, honestly. Uh, it's more like a problem of the system, as you were both saying before, like we don't talk about mental health. Uh, so there is a lack of knowledge because of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, being confronted sometimes with these comments that you are like, for me, something really obvious, but then they put you also in reality, they bring you back to earth, like, maybe this is not obvious for everyone because we are not talking enough about it and it's not been taught like in formal schools, um, formal settings where most of the people get their education and knowledge. And yeah, that will be something to change. Thank you. Ines, has there been something that you encountered that surprised you positively or negatively? Um, so... What surprised me positively was that there are actually more young people like me who really wanted to get involved in something uh, like uh, organizations and volunteering and nonprofits in order to make a change and change for the better. Um, I really wasn't expecting that because of all the as Alejandro was saying, all the lack of knowledge. And I think people sometimes, it's not that they don't really care about something, it's just that they don't really know 
uh, what's being talked about. So they just don't talk about it. But yeah, that was something that surprised me uh, in a positive way, especially seeing how our youth mental health works as an organization. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, for me, I I was thinking what would be my answer to my <laughs> to my own question. And last year we were celebrating this day at uh, the European Parliament in the European Youth Event. And we had also Maria Walsh with us, who was uh, earlier with, with you, Inish, and uh, another MEP. Um, and it was, um, for me, it was, I don't know, maybe it shouldn't be surprising because as you said, Alejandra, we all have physical and mental health. So why would we be surprised that an MEP would come and say, I have mental health problems too. But, uh, one of our guest MEPs shared a very personal story and everyone in the room was really moved. And it was like a sudden moment where we realized like, this is not just a concern of us as young people who can't access it. This is also something that people who maybe have better access, access to resources, they fight other kinds of obstacles. Uh, maybe it's you know, you're in a power position, so no one expects you to to be mental, to to be struggling mentally or so on. And I think sometimes we we might overlook the that let's say the, the adults in our lives or the people who are in these big institutions that we really respect. We we expect them to all be to be okay, or maybe we wouldn't expect them to to struggle and to share their struggles the way they do. And for me, it was a really was again so it shouldn't be surprising but it was this moment where i feel okay we are we are really all together in this because it goes it goes way beyond the the people who speak up like all of us have our own things and it was just a, a reminder of it uh Inish, do you have any would you, do you have any questions you would like to ask uh yeah so alejandra you're part of the trustee board I would love to ask if you could maybe explain for people who are not familiar with that, uh, how you're feeling about it, what's, what is your job like, what is this, the trustee board? Um, yeah, uh, so well, first of all, uh, I just joined recently and I got to know that um, the, um, the, the concept of board of trustees existed a month ago, so <laughs> I'm myself getting familiar with it. Um, but basically, from what I understand at least, and I will discover more in the upcoming months, uh, the idea of the board of trustees is also to make sure that the organization is running uh, properly, both like... Um, making sure that everyone like that all tasks are also distributed properly that when um, when there are things like issues like budget and finances that things are done in a proper way so there is an extra supervision and also that things don't go out of hand like let's organize an event for four thousand people but we don't have the human resources so it's a bit that role and specifically, I like it right now in Euro Youth Mental Health because as we are still like a small organization and we are developing, I also can get engaged in doing some actual work that this is the part that I like the most. I can attend these events, but also I can um, produce some content for social media and I can have a more active role participating instead of more passive. So that's something that I'm really happy to, to do and I'm really happy to be able to be part of the Board of Trustees and to keep supporting this organization from another perspective, but at the same time also working as uh, one more volunteer in the group. Thank you so much. Thank you for explaining. It's really great to, to see how we, we move. Also, we, we also grow with the organization. Um, but yeah, trustee is normally one position that, uh, or let's say this, um, executive committees or executive boards, we often associate them with older people who maybe want to do some philanthropy work. So how does it feel being a, a very young person? Well, not very, very young, but still you're quite young. You're not the typical trustee. How does it feel to you? Is it, 
exciting? Is it a bit scary? It's quite exciting. I've been in a board of directors before of a youth organization, so it's not something fully new for me. But uh, yeah, I noticed like, for example, like most of the other trustees are older than me. And but still, it feels really nice to, that there is the opportunity for young people. I still consider myself really young, <laughs> and like like us to be part of the board of trustees and be able to contribute from this perspective. Great, and also something new to youth mental health was our uh, new strategy that we launched this year. Uh, we're not going to, to explain it in much detail here but because we had an event focused on that, but we had the presentation of Raise Up. You can uh, find it on our social media and website. Uh, what is for you, Alejandra and Inés, what is something that excites you about this strategy? Like something that you were glad to see there or maybe that something that you really wanted to or something that you really want to see happening, let's say, in the future for us? I think the fact that we want to do more more trainings, more events, more capacity building is something really nice. I mean, I'm a trainer myself and I love trainings and education, so I'm always gonna um, I'm always gonna love it for that. But I think it's something really nice and really exciting and that will give the opportunity to volunteers in your youth mental health to share, to um, deliver trainings, but also to attend trainings, get more knowledge and spread the knowledge that we already have. And also to have more people uh, getting that knowledge. So I think that part is really exciting for me. Yeah, um, I'm very excited uh, about this strategy because I think it, leave, it gives a clearer uh, picture of what the organization really is driving for. And it, it gives us an idea that, yes, we are young, but we, we do care about things and we are part of an organization and people who might be getting into this organization after this, um, we do care and we appreciate and welcome all the training that we're going to get. And it is a collective, so it's it's a team effort. And I love the that it focuses on team building as well. So we all stay connected and support each other and accommodate each other. Perfect. I, I share what of what you said. I think it's, it's really exciting that we are moving forward with a clear, vi clearer vision, and that we we have all these things to look forward to, and also the the collective aspect. Like I was mentioning one year ago, we were uh, in Strasbourg, so many of us were meeting all for the first time, and uh, it really well. Now it feels like we're advertising for ourselves, but Iriot Mental Health does really feel like a, a bit of a, a group of friends, and it's a very safe place to be. So. Uh, it's it's very exciting. We are coming up with the raise up, which is also a way to to rise up our our own work. And to wrap up our uh, roundtable, I would ask you what would be like for a final comment. So, as young people, as volunteers, as engaged Europeans, what would be your final message on this important day that we are celebrating today? I think I will say, um, as I said before, we all have mental health and we all have to take care of it as we also have to take care of our physical health. And yeah, to not hesitate to ask for help, either if it's professional help or to a family member or a friend or a stranger, if you feel more comfortable with that. Uh, if you feel like you're struggling, that you may need some support or that if you feel like that something is not going right. And yeah, that it's something normal. It happens to everyone. And we should really talk more about mental health and mental health problems and make it and stop making it a taboo. Yeah, and uh, I think I... Your youth mental health is a, an organization that is run by youth and young people. 
So I really wanted to leave the message of hope and maybe some kind of inspiration that for the young people who think that we don't really have a say in, on things and we, we really don't have much power in our hands, we do. And there are places that you can join, like this organization and others uh, around Europe where you can make a change and you do make a difference in this world. Perfect. Thank you both. Um, once again, I think I, I subscribe both of your messages and I think something very important I learned over the years is um, that we should also give ourselves the same kindness we give to others because maybe we sit down with our friends and say, hey, it's okay to be sad. It's okay not to be okay. But then when we are the ones who are not okay, we try to, to hide it or repress it or just blame ourselves for not being at our best all the time. And I, I guess that would be my, my, my message to, to treat yourself with the same kindness and the same compassion that you give to others. Because um, if we, we do have our support and like Nikki is saying, it's the, the perfect message to close up. We all can make a difference. So thank you so much both. Thank you, Nikki, for your comments. And there was also a few more people commenting. So thank you all. And we move on to our next session, I think. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna take a break, I believe. Perfect. But so, yeah. We'll be right back. Thank you so much, Alejandra, for being here and everyone who commented. Um, yeah, I just really wanted to highlight the, this comment that uh, I'm sorry if we, I'm gonna butcher your name, but Kid Kinsey. Uh, um, they said, unfortunately, mental health is still stigmatized. Bringing more awareness in schools should be a priority as mental issues are experienced starting from a young age, even younger than most think. Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. And that's that's why I think that's one of the reasons why I joined. And you both too. So, yes, yeah. we'll be back. Thank you so much for Thank everyone. You. Yeah.
Hello everyone, welcome back to um, the next part and the next interview well, uh, for today's I Feel You Feel. How are you doing, Joanna? You all right? Good, how are you? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, I'm taking over from Inesh for this one. Uh, she's just having a break. Um, Joanna, are you all right to lead the hosting for this session today? This particular sure. one. Thank you. <laughs> So, I mean, we're co-hosting anyway, aren't we? So it's all yes, right. exactly. You can, yeah. our, our little talk show. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just bring in our next guest and uh, we'll go from there. Welcome. So it's Pavlos and we're going to see if we get his name right. Theodorakis. How is that, Pavlos? Oh, Excellent, I would say. <laughs> I don't know if there can be something more than excellent. I would use it. <laughs> How are you? Nice to see you, Nick. Nice to see you, Joanna. You too. You have a beautiful background. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. But this was not my choice, to be honest. <laughs> I have I have promised to Nick that although I'm on, um, I'm on annual leave, I'm on my holidays that I will... Uh, try to uh, be from my uh, desktop at the from my laptop at the hotel at least but unfortunately my son with whom uh, every every 10th October actually now I realize that that <laughs> that, that, that that it happens every year the same period um, we are having some um, holidays together in uh, autumn as well as in uh, spring so this one the autumn one happens to be every year around the 10th so i'm uh, i'm you find me at the uh, lago di garda at um, uh, lake garda in northern uh, italy where we are coming every year to uh, actually increase our mental space a bit and uh, and treat our mental health every year it indeed sounds like a great way to, to celebrate this day. So thank you so much for being with us, uh, in spite of being on your on your holiday. Um, and maybe you could share with us and the, the audience, what do you do when you are not uh, on, on your annual leave? What is your yeah. role? And... Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, just a clarification here. Um, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Nick, for uh, make, making me the coordinator of the entire mental health program for Europe. <laughs> I much appreciate that. <laughs> but, I couldn't remember the exact title, and obviously, yeah, you, okay. you of you yesterday. This, you know, if it goes together with a fifty percent increase in my salary, I will take it. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. I'm a senior advisor on uh, health policy in the uh, World Health uh, Organization uh, uh, European uh, region. And uh, but uh, what is uh, very close to my heart and with uh, what I'm dealing the last 25 years of my professional life uh, is um, um, mental health uh, services reforms and uh, more specifically large scale health system mm -hmm. transformations. Um, in uh, the mental health uh, services um, sphere and uh, more specifically in uh, the WHO European region. The coordinator of the mental health program, which I'm sure that uh, you know very well, is one of the four flagship programs for the five years 2020-2025. And um, this is led by my very good colleague and uh, friend, uh, Dr. L uh, Lydia Lazary, and uh, actually uh, Cassie Redlich, uh, as well as uh, Jennifer Hall, that uh, you both know them, uh, they work um, uh, together with uh, uh, Lydia. And my role uh, in this uh, team uh, is to technically advise and uh, support the uh, quality mental health services for children and adolescents program that uh, has been uh, launched um, approximately six months ago. It was last, last uh, April. And um, the, let's say, the into brackets headquarters of, uh, of uh, this uh, program 
um, are hosted by the WHO Quality of Care Office, which is based in Athens, and it is uh, funded by the Greek uh, um, uh, government. So, but in WHO, we have, um, we are trying to work in a very agile way, independently of where you are, if you are in Copenhagen, if you are in Greece, if you are in Moscow, just to tell you where my real base is, I'm a senior health policy advisor at the WHO country office in the Russian uh, Federation. But all together, wherever we are in the 53 countries, we are working all together because we all have the same the same goal. And this is nothing more than the health and well-being of uh, the one billion people that live in the European region. Which is... Uh... Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your work and thank you for, like you just said, we all of us have mental health. It's not, I, I read something these days that said, oh, I don't know how many thousand people have mental health in the country. And I'm like, no, we all have mental health. Some of us have, <laughs> have it better or worse, but we all have mental health. And we all <laughs> need to have it looked after so actually i was looking very much forward to have this question from you <laughs> myself but i didn't hear it yet <laughs> yes so so yeah thank you thank you for for that work and uh we know that you are with this flagship program for those who who are not fully aware of the, the work that you've been doing could you explain maybe on a very um, let's say, in a, in a very simple way, what is the flagship program and uh, what are the, the main goals that you want to achieve? Yes. Thank you. What is very interesting here, I think that I should um, uh, start from that, is that um, our regional director, uh, Dr. Hans Kluge, who is uh, uh, leading the work in the 53 member states in WHO, uh, European region has identified far before the COVID-19 pan pandemic. I mean, since uh, 2018, when uh, he started his uh, campaign to become uh, region director and uh, four flagship uh, initiatives, uh, one of them uh, was uh, mental health. And um, of course, I would say that uh, he could, in a way, feel the real needs. And, and, you know, in just one year after the launch of the flagship um, uh, programs, um, now everybody realizes that uh, mental health of the population, not only in, uh, in Europe, but uh, all around the globe, the globe, is definitely the top priority. I can reassure you that wherever I go in the European region and beyond, in whatever event, whatever is the focus, mm -hmm. mental health is there. And everybody, prime ministers, ministers of health, um, even, even clinicians from other specialties uh, are uh, asking for the governments, are asking from the stakeholders, international and national, local stakeholders, to focus on, 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 um, on uh, mental health. And from my very, very own um, uh, experience uh, since, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, mid-90s that uh, I started working uh, with, with mental health is the first time in my life that I see so many organizations, so many political leaders, uh, so many scientists uh, coming together to deal with it. And uh, this makes me really feel uh, optimistic. Uh, and this is actually the goal of the mental health coalition, the pan-European mental health coalition of the World Health uh, Organization, to bring everybody together, to bring everybody together around this utmost important uh, uh, um, uh, topic. And I would like to connect this with the question 
how many will face a mental health problem in their life? And I will frankly answer to that. The prevalence of mental health disorders is 30% at any moment. With other minor mental health uh, issues from distress to, um, to anxiety, to depression, to major ones. But, and I'm saying that knowing very well what I'm saying, there is not even one human being at least in this small part of the galaxy, Earth, that we live, that will not, or haven't, or will not face such an issue in his life. And whoever says that he never faced it, I, I, I think that he just don't want to share it. And of course, we very much respect that. Eh? And this is something very, very personal. But uh, and this is my opinion. I uh, I share it uh, with you, and uh, I feel very sure about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is, I, I of course, <laughs> from, from my personal perspective, I could say from your youth mental health, we we absolutely agree with you. Just like we all have physical health, we all have mental health, and uh, it shouldn't be. Um, a myth <laughs> to talk about it or think that only people who have clinical diagnosis are the ones who or need mental health support. And it was also great to hear when you share that uh, now mental health is on the agendas everywhere. Uh, because indeed, we, I think many of us have been waiting for, for this momentum. Um, so maybe for uh, as, a, as a final question, or maybe we'll have time for one more. Uh, but just before, we were having a roundtable with young activists uh, for mental health, and we were discussing on um, how I feel like we need to not only uh, talk about mental health and bring it into schools and uh, early, uh, early education so that we can destigmatize, but also that funding and access are, are essential because mental health is still seen as a, a luxury and a privilege for, by many people. Uh, what do you think has still to be done in that regard? And how can we as young people help achieve that? Honestly, nothing to add to this um, excellent analysis that <laughs> you just uh, 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 shared with us. Uh, the answer, actually, three points. Participation first. Second, participation and third, participation. <laughs> Don't step back. Participate in every opportunity. You know, I was, really, it was a blessing for me when I, uh, when I received Nick's, Nick's uh, uh, invitation, which was actually not even a personal invitation. It was an email to several recipients. I, I immediately grabbed the, grabbed the opportunity. I really feel that uh, what you are doing is a blessing for you, is a blessing for me, is a blessing for my family, is a blessing for everybody who lives in our region and uh, especially kids, uh, adolescents to have uh, this opportunity. Our office in, uh, uh, in uh, Athens uh, is uh, really uh, trying to push hard towards this uh, direction and nick please don't take me wrong but i want to find i want to take also this opportunity to say live to all these people that are following us that on 3 4 and 5 november we have the first ever mental health week uh, for the european region uh, the 53 member states that will take place in athens greece and uh, we will have uh, uh, three full days, not of this typical um, uh, conference uh, way uh, discussions that, you know, we as, you know, the experts, we get the floor and talk. On the contrary, more than 70, 80 percent of these three days is organized for adolescents for young people from adolescents and young people for adolescents and young people with concerts, with uh, with workshops, with stands, with uh, with 
whatever uh, you can imagine. Um, uh, actually, I would like even to propose to you to to join uh, to join us uh, uh, even virtually and uh, try to see how we can uh, take the best out of it. Because, for example, the concert with uh, some um, um, artists that are very close to the uh, in uh, Greece. Um, sorry, just to sorry. <laughs> No worries. Give me one second. That's okay, Pablo. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we yep. can hear you. Okay, sorry, but I had another incoming call. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, um, we can uh, find also different uh, platforms to live stream it. Um, we uh, will um, issue uh, 500 invitations for this. Um, um, for this uh, event, and um, uh, most of them uh, will be uh, people that are using mental health services uh, in the city of Athens, uh, also the ENOS, the Israeli Mental Health Association, um, uh, will uh, join us, uh, approximately 60 experts from all around Europe, but most importantly, more than 300 service users will be there uh, all together for three uh, days uh, to uh, work and discuss, uh, but at the same time uh, dance and, uh, and uh, work together um, for what uh, young people, adolescents uh, need and how they envision uh, uh, services and in more general care. Uh, for uh, mental health in their lives. Well, that sounds absolutely inspiring. And um, I think in the youth field, we often talk about the nothing for us without us. And, and it's great to see that steps are being taken in that direction. So thank you for, for being here and for all the work you are doing. And just as a wrap up, maybe I would ask you if, if you would like to share if there's any inspiration that you have that has been uh, driving you forward in these many years of work in this in this field? Uh, maybe a, an inspir a personal inspiration or a message of inspiration you could share with us? Yes. Oh, th thank you for the question. To be honest, I haven't thought of that because it was not on the list. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, the moment you're starting uh, uh, making the question, immediately something came to my mind. It's a very, very, very short story. In uh, 2004, I was uh, still, um, I was a research associate at the London School of Economics. And at that time, I received an offer from the Greek government to go back to Greece. And actually, my uh, post description was very, very straightforward. I think it was the shortest post description ever made. Pavlos, you have to close down the first psychiatric hospital in Greece. This was the post description. So I came to Greece and I remember on the way from the airport, a driver came to pick me up to get me to my new job, which was the CEO of the psychiatric hospital of Kanya, Crete. Probably some of you have visited Greece, which is also my hometown for vacations in the summer, or will visit definitely in the forthcoming years. So the drive was an hour, uh, approximately an hour and a half. So I said to uh, Kostas, it was the name of the, of, uh, the guy who was driving uh, the psychiatric hospital's car, driving to me to my new post. Oh, I said, this is a very, very interesting assignment. I think that we, we, we can make great things etc and he was not responding and i said we can close the asylum very quickly we can develop community mental health services for for the elderly for 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 the population especially for for children and adolescents he was not responding at all you know i, I couldn't understand what was his behavior and Finally, after an hour and a half, when we arrived at the hospital, he said to me, 
I think that I will get you very soon back to the airport to take the plane back because you are not going to stay here long. And I say, why is that? And he said, because nothing of what you are, you have envisioned will happen. Here, nobody wants to close the asylum. Nobody wants to open community mental health services. Nobody wants to open services for children and adolescents because this is a taboo and we don't need this service, etc., etc. So, this, uh, I would say, event, event really inspired me so much that it is guiding my life since three, since then, the last 18 years. And just to close this meeting with a happy end, 18 months after this drive, the psychiatric hospital has closed 33 community mental health units across the island of Crete that covers one million population were developed and the first ever children and adolescent mental health service on the, services on the island of Crete in the city of Hanya was developed. This is a story that I would like to share with you and uh, uh, try to transfer to you my optimism and I'm sure that all together we will do it. Amazing, truly inspirational. Thank you so much. I think it's a, a great takeaway, uh, especially on the day we are celebrating. Thank you so much for. for Thank all the you. Work. Sorry, Absolutely. we started with daylight and we finished with the moon here in Garda. But... How lovely. <laughs> it's lovely. Thank you so much. And keep up, keep up uh, the good uh, work. And Nick, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will try also from, I will do it anyway from my side to keep uh, close contact with you. And don't forget 3th, 4th and 5th uh, November virtually to connect. Thank you so much, guys. Thank and you. And happy Mental Health Day. Happy, happy Mental, mental health, health Day to you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we're going to have a short break, um, very short break, in fact. Um, but, <laughs> but we'll make sure we give everyone at least five minutes. We might start a bit later than 7.20 after having a wonderful chat with Pavlos. Um, so we look forward to seeing you back where we will have Agnes Seralta Fazikas uh, join us to talk about inclusive education. Uh, then following that, we'll have our closing session to finish today's events. Joanna, thank you very much. See you all soon.
Hi again. Hey. Welcome back, Inish. Thank you. Here we come for our final present or uh, our final talk of the day, where we will be joined by Agnes. There Thank she you is. so much. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for for waiting. Now everything is ready with the technical things, uh, and uh, I'm very very happy to be here. What I suggest that I introduce myself shortly. I uh, share uh, some of the tips I prepared, and then we can open the floor for many questions, and the floor can be. Uh, for the audience. How does it sound? Perfect. You, you prepared everything, so that's perfect. Thank you for, for doing so. And so please take the Thank floor. You. Thank you. So my name is Agnes Sarolta Fazekas. I am an assistant professor at the Alta University in Budapest, Hungary. And um, I uh, also the work package leader on inclusiveness for the CHARM EU European University Alliance. And I have also a shorter arm, hello. And uh, I have been working on human rights, education, inclusion, diversity, and, and education. These are my passion projects. And today I would like to share concrete tips and then give the audience the floor. Uh, what I promised uh, to the organizers that how we can ensure in the design and delivery uh, in the educational spaces that we consider inclusiveness and well-being and mental health. I am pro pro promised that I will bring three uh, practices from the non-formal education, mostly from youth activities. So I start with that. Um, so the first point of action is to really create a warm, welcoming atmosphere with the young people when we are organizing an event, starting with a holistic uh, needs assessment when we uh, ask about uh, uh, young people's or people's needs and we consider as, a, as, a, as, it's, uh, as a part of life as, as it should be. And part of this, we can also focus on the so-called wellness action plan, the WEP, which I also learned from the colleagues from the United Kingdom, where we also have questions that is uh, creates an, an uh, well-being, well-feeling, well-being uh, atmosphere for the program. And the second point is that uh, we can do uh, a so-called um, a preparation at facil uh, and facilitation when we have certain activities that maybe can trigger our, our uh, feelings, our emotions, so we can also engage with our audience that uh, when it's a sensitive topic, we can prepare them. So it's, it's also creating a well-being and a inclusive atmosphere. And number three is always providing our uh, support uh, in terms of uh, the physical space as well, such as the quiet rooms or the neutral space where also people can take a moment. Uh, it's also uh, well known in the literature and in the experience as quiet room, but it can also be as a religious room or any kind of an inclusive space when people can take a moment if they are overstimulated by any circumstances. So these are the top three. And from the higher education sector, we're just having some technical issues, but hopefully Agnes will be right back. Yes, the, the, the digital world is wonderful, but sometimes it also fails us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's back. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you. And for example, the 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 patience, practicing patience and accessibility is one of the good practices also when we are trying to 
redesign when something happens. And in higher education, we can discuss uh, how we create a welcoming atmosphere for educators, uh, just a few words in the beginning of the class, and also checking with the students in general, how are they feeling, how are they engaged in the classroom environment, is just very beneficial to all. So these are my six, six, uh, six or five to six points, and I give the floor to the audience for any questions. Thank you so much, Agnes. So um, I would uh, start with a, with a question that, um, well, I work in the field of uh, higher education myself, but I also am as a volunteer, not only in mental health, but in other associations, working with non-formal education. And I think in, in both worlds, it's not always um, clear the connection between inclusion and mental health. And we know those are two fields that you that, that you're focused on. So could you uh, maybe explain a little bit where do you see the main uh, bridging points between uh, inclusion and mental health, and maybe what can be improved in the educational contexts? Yes, I can definitely tell. So I mean, we all meet diverse audiences and diverse people uh, across our education settings, whether it's the higher education or like the very formal education or the non-formal or youth activities. And I must tell you many times we, we forgot or we are not designing into our everyday uh, activities uh, these elements. And um, um, this is what we need to br bring the bridges or, or create the bridges and starting to, to like um, consciously check ourselves, are we designing a space inclusive? What are the barriers? So a lot of reflecting questions. And uh, it's uh, everybody is, is uh, uh, experiencing some kind of, you know, stress or it can be anything on this spectrum of well-being and mental health. And if we are just consciously keep, keep uh, not forgetting, <laughs> Uh, those elements, then we can really create an inclusive environment. And if we make ourselves accountable for those things, and that's why I always tell my students, whether I am in higher education or the youth activities, that they should uh, feedback us that what, what is not working, what is not considering well-being, even just taking a 10-minute break in the classroom or during a session, and if somebody is not, you know, respecting it, it can also, like, we have all kinds of wonderful minds and wonderful emotions, so it can also trigger something. So tiny bits as, as these can really make uh, one step further. So these are the connecting elements, and the barrier is that we forgot these things, but we need to remind ourselves and keep our, our our audience uh, to check on us that are, are we doing a good job. <laughs> Indeed, feedback is, is so important. Um, I also have a, another question for you. It's a question I asked uh, earlier on to our uh, young uh, activists in the previous round table. Um, so if you, if you could create um, a policy on inclusion and mental health uh, in Europe, so I don't know, you're magically able to convince all the institutions that your policy is great. Uh, what would be the policy? What would you implement? Yes, it's a very good question. <laughs> Let's ask other stakeholders the same question. I would suggest that uh, I would really uh, have a roundtable discussion with uh, stakeholders who are in the leadership positions uh, in order to convince them and engage with them and find the common ground, because I believe that uh, we also need grassroots uh, activities uh, from bottom up and also top down. And if those of these activities are meeting, this is the magic happens. And we also need stakeholders to get engaged. So if I, if I would uh, uh, make a policy, then I would definitely start the dialogue and the conversation with 
with leadership, whatever is, is the leadership of a university or any kind of activity or whatever, and um, and check with them that if they are really committed to this policy, uh, how we can break down into step by step. And of course, the commitment is also a long journey, but uh, I think so many worldwide actions and, and European commitments are also showcasing that uh, as today is the World Mental Health Day, is that we are committed, we just need to figure out the step by step. So bringing stakeholders together, top down and bottom up approach and making uh, measurements or like measures uh, of monitoring and how to make them accountable. So if there is something is written in the policy paper, has it happened or what is the kind of the, you know, not the punishment, but like a, a cut making us accountable and in, it can happen in any other field as well. Oh, that's, I would vote for, for that policy. That's, that's really great. Thank you. And maybe Ines, I'll pass you the floor in case you have some questions. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you so much for all your great answers. And I'm not sure uh, if you identify as disabled or a person with disabilities. I, I am disabled and I'm always keen to ask um, such knowledgeable disabled people, uh, how do you, what practices do you take in your own life to um, better you or maintain your mental health? Because everyone talks about movement, but I would really like uh, your input on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I also thank you so much for the question. I also identify myself as a person with a disability and I also um, like um, committed to, to that, that we are talking about disability in a in a, you know, in a human rights based approach model when I'm also working with many people. And in terms of my, my commitment is, and my daily approach is that I try to make sure that I do the tiny bit, uh, the tiny bits of, of my well being, um, like, uh, uh, that taking a breaks or, or uh, stopping activities if I'm overwhelmed, and also raising awareness uh, when I when when I am in organizational settings and people are over you know over uh, putting a lot of pressure on on each of us or or on on ourselves, and I I am telling them to very kindly but also you know strategically that that we need to practice what we are saying and, and this also helps and it's also me to to keep myself accountable for the little things but like enough sleep and also talking with friends and and people i am you know, in a good relations to to talk out if i if i'm overwhelmed or if i if i need to find somebody and i think so this Peer support is is has been also beautifully uh, worked in any uh, youth settings or any higher education setting when students have a body person or a body system or a, a mentor, uh, just a person to check up on you from time to time, and it gives you a good good thing. And I'm also very grateful for all of my friends and family and the people around me who are making sure that my well-being is is tight. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for that like amazing answer thank you and it's great you touched upon the body and support groups because uh earlier on when we were having a discussion with the uh, young activists uh, we had a comment saying that um peer support uh saves their lives so um, we cannot forget the power that each of us that each of us holds, and that was very clear in your answer. So thank you so much. And maybe to wrap up, um, I will also repeat the question. So for the people who are watching before, I am asking the same questions, but I'm always uh, very keen to take some hopeful and uh, inspirational things with me. 
from this event. So maybe if you would like to share with us uh, what, what inspires you in this journey, because you have done an incredible work in this field uh, of, of inclusion and of pushing forward um, well, uh, well-being environments. So maybe what, what is an inspiration to you that uh, you could share with us? Mm, thank you so much. Yes, I think so that uh, I would definitely say the people around me and I can start uh, listing uh, a long list of wonderful people who also shape my own journey, my professional and personal journey. And uh, uh, the, that finding or meeting people who are uh, similarly passionate about human rights, inclusion, diversity, education, mental health, well-being, all these things that are um, very dear to me. This energy that, that is, comes from them is also influences and impacts me. And with this, uh, with this energy, I, I can move uh, further and push further. And I must say many times, we have a lot of you know negotiation processes or decision making processes where these topics are not always um, very high on the agenda but with this energy and with the people behind or around me or or all around me in physically and, and virtually but they, they are really helping and i think so this is a good thing and also when i'm working with organizations who are in general open. And I, I have a recent. We're having some technical issues again, but hopefully uh, Agnes will be here soon. Yes. Um, I'm here. <laughs> Okay. Amazing. <laughs> you amazingly come back very quickly. So even in your tech, you are doing great. Thank you for coming back every time. <laughs> so using uh, the technical barriers, but we are not not worried because we, we try to find a way to reconnect. But what I was saying that uh, what is also important for me is the openness of organization I have been working with, including uh, the Charm EU community I have been involved. Uh, this is an uh, organizational transformation. It's, it's a journey, it's an inclusion journey we are on. And of course, uh, it's a learning process, but I'm so, so grateful if, if, if an organization, if an entity, if a group is open, and open to learn, open to experience things. And this is this is what keeps me happy and keeps me pushing more for inclusion and, and well-being and everything. So this is my message to all of you. Thank you so much. So maybe one, I would I would say that you are kind of an activist through your own work. Uh, what would be your, let's say, in one sentence, what's your advice for all young active, young or not young activists out there? Um, trying to make sure that mental health is normalized and is a part of our lives? Mm -hmm. mm, it's a very difficult question. I mean, um, I would say that uh, um, that they should find uh, people who are who are engaged in, in, in for the same cause, for the same same issues. And once we are connected with each other, as and this peer support happens, we can really move forward, and this also gives hope that that we can we can work towards these topics. And uh, this this personal support or peer support is also good when we are getting tired or getting a little bit overwhelmed or a lot of happen, lot of things happen. So again, I would say one word: being surrounded by community and of course sometimes we want to be alone or sometimes people are around us too much but having the choice to to find the people around us is i think so is the most important thing and they they are they are here even just a question that are you okay or do you need anything and we can also 
find ways how we can simplify this question that is also on a human rights based approach model to to well being and mental health. Perfect. That was that was really great. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Oh. <laughs> Up to now, she was with us. I hope she comes back so we can thank her for all these great yeah. input and advices. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for coming and joining us. I really love talking to you. Yes, and um, oh, well, I think uh, I can. Um, for all of us, we we really thank you for for being for being part of the event, but also for taking the this the, this um, fight forward. Um, we all need to to keep speaking up and. For, for your mental health, it's really important to have uh, all the stakeholders with us and uh, joining us and joining them that we did the, the journey together as a community, as you said. Uh, so thank you so much for, for all that you do on that and uh, for being with us. Yeah, I think thank we... You so much. Sorry. Yeah, I think we uh, gonna welcome back Nick for the closing. Oh, Agnes is gone. <laughs> wow, Nick, wow. there's uh, so much sun there. I know, I love the goat. I mean, you created the irritant with the health, so we know you are a bright mind, but right now you're also a good face. <laughs> Put on a proper light. There you go. That's a bit better. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, welcome back. We give really you the floor. It's good to be back as we finish up. I, I yeah. want to say a huge thank you to Agnes as well. That was incredibly inspiring. Um, actually, listening. Yeah. To them. So, yeah. how are you both feeling as we come to the end of the, this uh, five-hour marathon of a conversation? Inesh, especially if I can come to you first. You've you've been a lot of today. How how are you feeling? Yeah, I, I'm feeling, you know, a bit tired, but it was an amazing uh, event. I was so happy to talk to each of our guests and to have you and Amira and Joanna by my side. Uh, it was really incredible, like so many good conversations. What about yourself, Joanna? So you came in halfway through, and you've had a, had, had the pleasure of chatting to uh, Alejandra, um, Pavlos, and Agnes. Yeah, it was it was great. I, I share what Inir said. It felt like uh, was we were having a, a set of really wonderful and inspiring conversations. That um, well, I, I was also taken aback for when we did the first uh, first edition of uh, "I Feel You Feel," and I remember. By the end of the day, we all entered uh, a chat together to celebrate how, how how great it felt to to bring in different stakeholders and different young people, and just um, highlight that we are all we, there's many of us in the fight, and that feeling is back again. So it's great to celebrate this day with such a hopeful uh, and joyful manner. Absolutely, and just how are you just, feeling, Nick? How am I feeling? I am feeling incredibly proud, um, inspired, and I think a bit. Um, what's the word? Not over, not overwhelmed, but just um, emotional. Yeah, no, just more inspired. <laughs> I guess it's just. I think it's the, the speakers we've had. I think has been a really good um, mixture, shall we say, then of of people from different areas of the work. I think I always find inclusion and mental health a really interesting conversation. Because uh, people always assume it's to do with physical uh, disabilities and uh, sensory. Um, that's it. But so it was really nice to have Agnes on talk about that and just hear from some of the people that we're going to be working with in the future. And the plug I've been putting links in the comments throughout today. Uh, if for anyone watching who'd like to be involved in our work, please do get in touch. But yeah, I'm feeling really proud, and I think um, we've had quite we've had good engagement. Um, and we'll be we'll be cutting these up into smaller uh, 
sort of individual interview sessions uh, that we'll publish on YouTube as well at some point so people can watch each individual uh, interview. Um, but, so that's how I feel. But so I guess what I'd like to ask, obviously, Joanna, you've only come on at the second half because bless you, you've come straight after work. Um, and Inesh, I'd like to ask you both maybe what are one or two of your key takeaways from any conversations that you've had today or just some epiphanies that maybe you've had yourself. Uh, Ines, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so my biggest epiphany today was the take of um, Dennis and Simone talking about how we need to talk more of what we're doing right in mental health and not just talking about mental illness in general. I thought that was just such an important thing to say. And I really don't think about that a lot. You know, I, as an activist and uh, being so discriminated, being part of minorities, I'm always like, okay, so what, what can we do better? What, what are we doing wrong? And sometimes it's good to take some time and acknowledge what we're doing right. Sorry, long pause and kind of, um, pull some fan, fa funny faces. Um, I think we're, we are all so incredibly guilty of not focusing on when we do things right and celebrating our successes. I'm happy to. I'm very guilty of that. Um, today's a good example. You know, we've worked very hard for today. Now, as soon as today finishes, I'm going to be like, right, what's next? Um, without taking the time to think, and we, we are, I do this not just about work, but lots of things, you know, um, and so it, it's, it's not surprising that it's the same in a professional capacity that we, we're always thinking, right, what needs fixing? And don't get me wrong, there are loads of things that need fixing, um, especially in the world today. Um, but like, you, like as Dennis said, and uh, talking, you know, it's important to sometimes focus on the positive things. Thank you for sharing that, you know. Um, Joanna, what about yourself? Um, yeah, it was, it's a difficult question because there was uh, the three conversations I had were really interesting and I, I would say extremely positive. We, we really had a positive tone in these conversations. Um, but I think it was when I asked uh, Pablos, like, what do we need to do? And he says, number one, participation, number two, participation, number three, participation. Um, so I, I I, even though I've been on a, a participation journey for a while and I've been, I will say the word privileged enough to do so because we all know that not all young people have for many reasons this, uh, the same platform that we, that we do and the same access to them mostly because maybe the platforms exist but then the, the access is lacking. So um, even though I've been doing this for a while, I'm always positively surprised when someone who is in an official capacity within the organization says, we want to listen to you. We want to, we you to come in. And the way that he told, you know, he told us the story about how he went from being hired to shut down a, a mental hospital to creating community uh, health, uh, mental health support uh, uh, services. And it was just really inspiring to think on, both him and Agnes actually are, are two great examples on how through our own work, we can create an impact and we can move forward to what we want to see. Uh, so that's that's something that I'm definitely taking with me. And going again to the celebrating the small wins whenever we think like, ah, oh, I should be doing more. I, I'm not impacting enough. I'm not doing enough. Uh, we're all part of the, the puzzle and we need to remember that and uh, give ourselves a pat in the back for either how big or small of a piece we are. Uh, we are we're, we're in the puzzle, so let's not forget that. Absolutely. Thank you, Joanna. And I think, as you say, it's, um, yeah, I think that's a quote. I'm going to have to get our comms lead, Lizanne, to uh, <laughs> Pavlos. Participation, participation, participation. Absolutely. Um, I think it's important to mention um, what you just said that you talked about privilege and we're not going to go into that in depth but privilege around participation and i've had conversations with young people about that before is it, it's a lot to do with access and a bit of opportunities and availability to be involved um and 
especially with the current cost of living crisis that is hitting a lot of countries in different ways. But people are folk it might be not, there's a privilege in being able to volunteer your free time sometimes, isn't there? And that actually you have a stable job and therefore you can do that. Whereas some people don't have that space. Um, but what I'd like to encourage everyone who may be watching this or watch this at a later point is get in touch and we you can get, you can participate. We proud ourselves on enabling people to participate in as little or as big a way or or as a in i shouldn't say little or big but in a variety of methods some that take small amounts of time some that could be year for a year or longer um so there's always ways that you can participate if you're working with good participation workers and organizations actually um just to finish um you know and joanna for those people who are maybe watching and thinking, oh, should I get involved? Or um, uh, should, should, and maybe not even with us, maybe they're watching us and thinking, oh, I should volunteer for that charity down the road, which is also amazing. Um, what advice would you maybe give to young people thinking about volunteering either locally or internationally uh, in, and everything in between? Um, yeah, uh, so before I got so uh, involved in activism, mental health, uh, not just with this organization, but others, was that I was not uh, capable enough or didn't really have any anything to add to the conversation, uh, which is which a lot of young people think that way. They think that they are not knowledgeable enough, that they don't have... Uh, as much experience as older people, uh, so older people being, um, I don't know, you, you, you consider yourself old. I think eighty uh, years ago, so Excellent. people who have trained. Well, yeah. yeah, so yeah. they have that mindset, and I think that's so not true. I think young people have a lot to add to this conversation, and we this organization uh, so because we're, we're talking Euro youth mental health uh, is amazing at giving uh, young people a platform in order to participate and have a say in making decisions and supporting each other and from from my experience they're very uh, Nick is amazing at uh, make it it's true so i always always felt included uh he always makes the his best to accommodate everyone as i said i'm disabled and nick has been amazing at helping in every accommodation that i need so yeah i encourage everyone even uh 14 year olds if you really think you don't have anything to add you really do so just if not with your youth mental health with other organizations uh, even locally so yeah thank you Ines. and just to add yeah absolutely i think no organization is perfect at it but a good organization will admit when they're wrong and might need help from you as the volunteer of the activist on how to be doing things better uh, joanna what about yourself yeah i i follow a lot of what you said um I think back when I was a teenager, when I was in high school and I had so much free time and I didn't know, I mean, I was, I wanted to do things. I had ideas, um, but my own self-esteem was telling me to, to stop like, oh, okay, maybe it's not a good idea. Who will want to listen to this? Who will want to do this with me? Um, and then it actually took me a long time and moving to a different city and uh, having doing my own journey to to understand that like Ines was saying your your voice matters you you have something to give um even if when you look in the mirror maybe you still don't see it you you do have something to give um so i'd say like really don't don't sell yourself short um i once was told this this story that that stuck with me for a long time um from someone who went to do volunteering in a some kind of a social center in uh, I don't remember which country in Africa. And she said, oh, you know, I was going to work in uh, kindergarten. And I felt like that they didn't need me because I have zero skills with children. I had zero like building skill. Like if they needed something to be rebuilt, I know nothing about that. I don't have any like muscle strength, but I went anyway. And once I got there, I realized they had no colors in the walls. They had no colors anywhere. 
they used just colors for um, uh, you know getting the clothes dyed. So they had some natural colorings, but they yeah. didn't. The children didn't use them. So yeah. she was able to teach the kids how to mix the colors and create colors and paint the walls, and with something that she never. She you know she was like, oh, I was the less suitable person to volunteer. She was able to change not only her life but also give literally color to the lives of many children and the people who worked with them. So, you know, you never know where you can bring color with what you have in you. You don't need a degree. You don't need a prior experience. You just need to, to show up. And uh, for sure, the help you are able to give is going to be welcome. Another quotable sentence. And I think it's going to end. Um, Joanna, thank you so much. That is a lovely story. And I, I think just to echo that, absolutely. Sometimes it just takes the first step and a, a, an enthusiasm to do some good. There will be some, you will have something that you can give that someone else needs. Um, so um, on that note, any final thoughts from either of you two? I don't want my voice to be the last voice. I'm going to leave it to you two to sign off. Oh my God, yeah, because that would be so awful that you would be. Nikki, <laughs> <laughs> no, imagine having everyone at the table, including yourself, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed uh, today. And thank you so much for the, this opportunity. <laughs> no, I don't know what to say. I feel like I should say <laughs> All I can say is really also thank you. I mean, this this organization has been always a, a great platform. And we, we've really created a, 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 I don't want to say a family because it's really cheesy, but um, I do feel like the, the group that we have, the people that are around, all of us know that um, they have somewhere to, to rely on. I remember, again, I'm thinking during COVID when we did this event the first time, how how everyone pitched in and how we celebrated things together, how we got our, each other through COVID, even though we were in different countries. Um, so yeah, don't, don't underestimate your, your own power and the power of organizations. And um, happy World Mental Health Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thank you so much to everyone who watched and participated and was with us today. So thank you so much. Thank See you, you. soon. Bye.